Hey guys, something a little bit different today. I've compiled all the best pro revenge. Today is truly a long one, so buckle in for a wild ride of the best revenge stories Reddit has to offer. Try to stiff rent money owed? Enjoy having your drug habit exposed and losing your new house. The story. My dad had tried his hand in renting out houses, albeit it's only one house and he had only one renter. He's a soft heart and couldn't bear to force a family into the streets when rent wasn't paid. The renter was his work colleague and they were acquainted at best. This man would give every excuse in the book when he couldn't pay his rent, all of them relating to his toddler son. Medical bills for his son, formula and diapers, birthday gifts, so on and forth. My dad accepted these excuses, allowing his colleague to delay the payment and never once tried to deduct from the deposit. Six months later, his renter decided to move out. Turns out the jackpot bought himself a nice terrace house out in a good suburban area. He knew my dad was a patient and generous man and decided to take advantage of that. My dad, in his words, was pissed but, more than that, disappointed. He decided that he'll stop renting as he figured he would lose more than what he'll earn. Thus, the house was sold. A few days later, my dad approached his colleague wanting to know why he'd stiffed him out of his rent money. This took place in the middle of the office with everyone still at their cubicles or milling around. Dad said, colleague, I've heard you bought a house. If you had money for the house, why couldn't you pay for the rent? You know or not my son keeps falling sick? Ever since I stayed at that house you rent, my son always has a fever, always coughing. What does that got to do with me or that house? I think I know why. That house is haunted. Got gin. Genie, malevolent or mischievous. And shaitan. Devil slash demon. You're a new Muslim convert, right? Something must have pissed at you for converting. Because of that, my son is suffering. For context, us Malaysians still hold on to some superstition. Though it's more prevalent in the older generations, be it due to culture or religion, superstitious beliefs are still embedded here. A rented house being haunted usually means little to no potential renters and a sullied reputation. This ticked my dad off. At this point, everyone had tuned into this drama being unfolded. Raising his voice, he laid down the truth bomb. I stayed in that house for two years with my wife and small children. Nothing happened. You know why your son keeps falling sick? When I went to inspect that house to sell it, the whole place reeked of drugs. Every room in the house smells like marijuana. Your son keeps falling sick because you smoked drugs around him 24-7. If you've ever been slammed by the truth so hard that it left you speechless, that was essentially what happened. Colleague was stunned, mouth opening and closing like a fish gasping for breath, before turning and walking away. My dad, having vented that, left to do his own business. Colleague not denying outright that he didn't do drugs caused the rumor to spread like wildfire, with him ending up needing to do a drug test. Unsurprisingly, he failed that, which led to him being let go. Now, you may think it's the end. Drug use in Malaysia is seriously frowned upon here, even if you do it recreationally. Not to mention that other job prospects usually looked into your record and reason for resigning from your last job. Having being let go due to failing a drug test is an automatic resume into the bin. No job means no income. No income means colleague can't make the monthly installments for his new house. As my dad found out, it has been auctioned off by colleague's bank to another buyer. As he told me this, my dad never wanted to ruin colleague's life like that. He told me he should have just kept his mouth shut, that him knowing colleague was doing drugs in close proximity to his son was good leverage for colleague to pay his rent. It was a in the heat of the moment action and such. Dad never pressed to get his six months of rent money back. Considered it halal, meaning in his eyes, colleague's debt to him was voided. I don't know. Perhaps this was just karma by God for colleague lying to my dad and stiffing him his rent money. Just needed my dad to be a pawn in his plan to punish colleague in this life. The revenge was undeniably unplanned, but gosh darn, it is pro to me. Definitely a unplanned pro-revenge.
That said, if this was you and you had the chance to think about it, would you have just outed him like that and basically ruined his opportunity of getting a new job altogether? Or would you have just tried to use it as leverage to get your six months of rent back? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is also by Dujan Connoisseur. Try to squeeze my dad for his money. Tough luck. He knows money. The background. Back during the 1997 Asian financial crisis, Malaysia was hit pretty hard especially the small independent banks. The Prime Minister at the time, Toon Dr. Mahathir Mohamed, passed a bill to save the banking economy by having all the larger corporate banks buy out the smaller independent banks. At the same time, he made the One Malaysia Home Loan Policy. Under this, all larger banks that bought out the smaller independent banks must send an acknowledgement letter to the home loaners of their original banks stating the home loan change and must receive an acknowledgement from their new loaners, be it a signature, physical or digital. The Story My dad never liked how banks can legally rob people. For people like him who work the daily grind, having to pay the bank what is essentially two houses worth in interest payments over two or three decades is just plain wrong in his eyes. He strives to one day screw a bank over like how they screw their customers. A contract. Be it sheer dumb luck or is God listening to his prayers and decided him to grant that opportunity. That was what he got. When my dad bought our family's first home, he got a loan from a small bank called DCB Bank. All is well until a few years later the 1997 financial crisis hit. As the small banks were bought out by the larger banks, many homeowners received acknowledgement papers on their new home loan payment plan and policies by their new banks. My dad, for whatever reason, never received this. He only knew that his original bank was bought over by the RHB Bank Corporation and that he is now unofficially their customer. My dad was frugal with his money and God bless him, financially literate. He knew that if he made a full settlement against his principal loan, he can avoid paying 30 years worth of interest installments. Sometime in 2007, he went to a RHB Bank branch nearby to make a full settlement and this is how it went down. RHB employer, I'm sorry sir, even if you made a full settlement, you would still need to continue making payments for the interest. Dad said, what do you mean? I have a home loan contract under DCB that states I can make a full settlement without paying for additional interests. The RHB employer said, true, but since you've acknowledged and signed under RHB, Dad said, I've never received the acknowledgement papers. I've never signed any papers from your bank, and all I have here is the DCB bank contract. The employer said, sir, under the One Malaysia Home Loan... Dad said, you have to send acknowledgement letters about the loan transfer. Yes, I know. What I want now is for you, RHB Bank, to produce my signature of me acknowledging the new loan policy for RHB. As of now, my paper with DCB is still valid until you produce my signature. Cue one hour of the employer and her colleagues scrambling around their files and databases trying to find any acknowledgement from my dad about their loan contract. At this time, the manager of the bank had called my dad into his office to discuss this problem. It basically had went from civil to a shouting match that can be heard in the neighboring food stalls. My dad couldn't remember most of what was said, but the end of it was what he could still clearly remember, and to his son, it was probably one heck of a bad butt convo ender. The manager said, I'm sorry Mr. Muhammad, but you still need to make the interest payments regardless of whether you make a full settlement. Alright, I understand. I'll just have to take this up to Bank Nagara, National Bank of Malaysia. Let them help you find that signature of mine. My dad had the bank manager by the balls now. Rather risking a potential million dollar lawsuit and possibly losing his job, he excused himself to make a few phone calls to upper management, which took about half an hour. After said phone calls were done, the manager approached my dad and agreed to the full settlement without the additional interest installments. To add salt to the wound, my dad requested that they have his housing grant ready within the week to which they delivered. All in all, my dad managed to secure himself a house, the housing grant, and in the process screwed RHB Bank of what is equal to 60,000 USD worth of interest payments, which to a middle-class Malaysian in 2007 is a retirement fund. 
I think you can only have respect for OP's father in this situation. It's completely the bank's fault that they never got the acknowledgement letter out to the father. If, if they had done that, this wouldn't have been possible. I'm surprised that a few years later they wouldn't have realized that they missed some people and had some secondary wave of acknowledgement letters going out or something. This next story is written by This Is Driving Me Batty. Badmouth me and assume I don't speak the language? I'll kill you with kindness. I am a light-skinned Latina American and I've lived in Korea for a couple of years during university and grad school, as my major was Korean interpretation and translation. During my time in Korea, I was lucky enough to attend music shows from time to time. For the K-pop uninitiated, music shows are free to enter, provided you have at least one of three items. A. A copy of the album of the group you're coming to see. B. Proof of purchase of the album digitally on one of the approved music vendors in Korea. Or C. The official light stick from the most recent concert. Priority entry was always given to official fan club members who had all three, then fan club members who had two of the three, and then fan club members who had one. After that came non-members in the same priority tier. The group I had come to see hadn't opened official fan club registration in almost a decade, so the group's management decided to do away with the fan club priority and did it on a first come first serve basis, but kept the whole three items go first, then two, then one thing. I had all three and I got there early, so I got a good spot in line. These queues often had us waiting outside for hours while the previous round of filming finished up. The thing about these music show venues is they're very small. They have limited capacity and allow two to three groups as fans in to watch them film at a time. So not all people who queue for a group get in. In this particular instance, there was trouble with foreign fans causing trouble by taking pictures, not listening to instructions. So venue staff literally went through and quizzed each foreigner in line on their Korean. If you couldn't understand, you were booted. I passed with flying colors and kept my spot in line. Here's where the revenge starts. Because of the aforementioned issues, a lot of Korean fans hated international fans with a passion. For this group in particular, so many people were pissed that they had to wait in line behind foreigners because they had done away with the official fan club priority. Now here's me, sitting alone in a queue outside on a hot summer day. A group of Korean girls sat in front of me and a lone Korean girl talking on her phone sat behind me. I was minding my own business playing games on my phone after passing my Korean quiz with the staff when I heard the girl behind me talking crap. She was chatting with a friend I suspect because she was dropping a lot of curse words and specifically mentioned, these foreign roaches ruining things for us, I want to kill them. She mentioned me in particular and said that she bet I'd bribe the staff to keep my spot in line even though I couldn't understand Korean. Okay, so it's harmless crap talk. I don't know this girl and I don't know her friend. In the long run, it doesn't affect me, right? But it really rubs me the wrong way, especially because she was talking quite loudly. So I grabbed my wallet, politely and quietly asked the Korean girls in front of me to watch my bag and hold my place in line and went to the convenience store. I bought a round of water for everyone. It was heavy. I had about a dozen bottles of water. I get back to my spot in line, thank the girls in front of me for holding my spot, then gave them each a water. I gave a water to the group in front of them too. Then I kept one for myself and turned around and handed one to the girl on the phone with a smile. Immediately she lit up and thanked me in English, smiling bright and taking her phone away from her ear. As I hand her her water, I say in perfect Korean and still smiling, the next time you loudly crap talk the foreigners, make sure they can't actually understand you. When I tell you it went silent in the immediate area, you could hear a pin drop. Her smile melted off her face faster than an ice cream cone on Florida pavement. She turned bead red and muttered to her friend on the phone that she had to go and sheepishly apologized. I accepted, she had water, and I felt better about myself. Bonus, the girls in front of me heard the whole thing and adopted me into their group for the day. Fun was had all around. There's something so extra satisfying about these kinds of stories. I absolutely never get tired of these kinds of stories where somebody's crap talking somebody thinking they can't understand the language and then boom, you're just able to just lay it on them. One, one good blow that absolutely shocks them to their core. 
And our final story of the day is by Kea Basa, who... Disgruntled Walmart lady doesn't like that she can't park in reserved parking. I work at a Walmart, specifically the online grocery pickup section. For anyone that doesn't get the basics of it, basically you place a prepaid order online, we shop it for you, then bring it out and load it into your car. Pretty simple. We are decently busy pretty much all day and as expected we have reserved parking spots, specifically 12 for the customers to come pull in so we can easily load their groceries. On one fateful day we were rather busy and the weather was quite bad, raining. This random lady pulls into spot number 12, so naturally I go outside to talk to her to get her name and order number and whatnot. Hi, how are you doing today? Good. Do you have an online order for pickup? No. She steps out of her car and begins to walk inside. Well, if you don't have an online order, you can't park here. This is reserved parking for our customers. Okay. And she casually ignores me and proceeds inside. Our manager printed notice papers to put on windshields for butt hats like her. They're nothing special, just made of paper. I took around 12 and lined her entire windshield with them. You could not see a speck of glass under the paper. Now, since it was raining, the papers almost instantly stuck to our windshield like glue and completely soaked on, to the point where wind wasn't blowing them off. I never caught her reaction or heard if she complained, but watching her scrape wet paper off her windshield in the pouring rain through our dispensary door was the most satisfying thing I've ever done during my time there. So simple, yet so effective. I'm sure this lady just about melted having to be in the rain for all that time scraping the papers off her windshield, but hey, you shouldn't have parked in a reserved parking spot during peak hours. Aggressively speed through a residential neighborhood? Now your car is wrecked and it's your fault, dumb bubba freaker. So this was quite a few years ago. One day my kids were skating in a quarter pipe when this truck comes around the corner with a bubba driving and he sees my daughter come off the quarter pipe and instead of slowing down, he floors it and rips past my house, still accelerating while yelling something about keep out of the road, freakers. I yelled also slow down. The following weekend, I'm out mowing my lawn and I see this guy coming, so I walk out to the edge and try to wave him down to talk, and Bubba floors it again, laughing like a maniac as he goes flying by with his engine redlining. This guy is a nut. So I go to the hardware store and picked up three of those three foot orange safety cones and I put a sign on each one of them, slow down, residential neighborhood, kids at play. A few days later, I come outside and find the cones have been run over. I already know who did it. I'm pretty pissed off, like really angry. And in that anger, I came up with my most brilliant plan. I went to the hardware store and purchased three new cones, along with cement and steel rebar. I filled those freakers with rebar and cement and let them set in. After the cones were ready, I put them back out on the side of the street by my house with the same three signs as before. It didn't take long. Two days later, I'm in my garage tinkering and I hear that darn truck engine revving up as the bubba goes pedal to the metal. I look up just in time to see his truck steer towards the shoulder to run over the cones. Darn, it was a beautiful sight like none I've ever seen before. He hit the first cone with his bumper and the cone fell forward and rotated the base up towards his engine block and actually lifted the front of his truck upwards as his front passenger wheel made a direct connection with the second cone and launched his truck up even higher in the air. The third cone also made a direct hit on his right tire suspension as his truck came down to a screeching halt. There were fluids running out from under his truck and his passenger tire was angled inwards at a 90 degree angle. Bubba was pissed off and started screaming about how I wrecked his truck and how I'm gonna pay. I yelled back and said, well then let's call the cops and get them out here to make a report and you can tell them how you were racing down the road and intentionally ran over the safety cones or I can call you a tow truck. Which will it be? We called a tow truck. I never did see Bubba drive down my street anymore after that incident. I was worried he'd try to get revenge, but nothing ever happened and we moved out a couple years later. Edit. Didn't expect this to blow up like it has. For those of you talking about the legality of what I did in getting busted or sued, let me clarify some things here. First of all, this happened a long time ago. The legal time limit has expired for anyone to do anything about it in any legal capacity. 
Also, I consider myself sharper than the average bear, and I didn't enact my plan without thinking it through and thinking about the consequences of my actions. I know a thing or two about how the law works. If Bubba wanted to call the cops, I'd have gone inside my home and locked the door. If the police arrived, I'd tell them through my locked security screen that I don't answer questions, and my only statement would be that I only speak through my attorney. At that point, the police would make the report and run it up the chain of command. If the state or local prosecutor wanted to conduct an investigation, I'd go with an attorney and deny any involvement. They'd have to, at that point, decide how much time do they have to try and investigate this matter and what is the likelihood of a conviction. Since I lived in a big city, I'm sure they had a lot worse stuff happening that would be taking up their caseload. Sounds to me like the truck driver probably had a bad record already. It's easy to be big and macho and say you're gonna pay for my truck, but this guy was obviously a bit of a lunatic and it seemed like the mere mention of police was enough to deter them. So I feel like that tells you enough. Our next story is by Gecko Mama. Job accused me of lying, so I got revenge. When I was 17 or 18 years old, I got my first retail job. I worked at a children's store that does ear piercings. I'm sure you all know which one. I started when I was 17, and shortly after turning 18, I was given a key holder position. I was thrown into the position with practically no instruction and absolutely no training. I did my best, even though I made mistakes, and I was actually doing fairly well. Time passes, I get back from a sleepover, and my mother informs me that while I was gone, my grandfather had passed away. Now, I worked just two hours after I got the news, so I went in still struggling not to cry my eyes out at any second. The first thing I see is the store manager standing there looking annoyed. She takes me over to a bench out in the middle of the mall and sits with me and starts telling me about all the things I'm doing wrong, all the things I hadn't been trained on, while I mostly just blankly stared at her and tried not to cry. I wasn't taking any of the information in at all, I was just too upset. Eventually she noticed and asked what was wrong, and I broke down and started sobbing and told her. I then asked if I could go home as I didn't think I could work efficiently with this news. She told me absolutely not and she left, leaving me completely alone in the store. Now, for context, the store sold these stuffed animals called Beanie Boos. They also had giant versions that were about $40 to $50 a piece, I think. It's been years since I worked there. But anyway, some lady walked in and decided to buy four of those and was ready to pay when I told her about a store close by that sold them for a cheaper price. She thanked me and left, having not bought them. So, there was my revenge for being rude and uncaring about his death. Then, shortly after, I found out from a friend and fellow keyholder that they had not only accused me of stealing a few dollar items, which I had not done, but they also had accused me of lying about my grandfather's death to get out of trouble. So, in a fit of fury, I called up the manager from before told her I quit, shut the store down two hours early, and went home. Probably lost them about $500 in total sales that day, and proud of it. I know it's not much in the grand scheme of things, they make millions, but it made me feel better. I now have a picture of my grandfather hanging where I used to hang my store keys. Absolutely my condolences to OP, I know it happened a long time ago, but still, the message of the story is there. I think it's completely understandable and it's incredibly insensitive that they thought that you were lying about a relative's death to get out of trouble for stealing a few dollar items which, again, you didn't even do. If this was you, would you quit on the spot? Would you just go home? Would you power through or maybe do your job badly and just deal with it? Let me know what you would have done in the comments below. The next story is by Afternoon Master. Customer was rude to me so I denied him his pizza. Not the most hectic of stories, but I thought I'd share it anyways. So, I'm a delivery driver at Domino's and had got a delivery that was in a street in a small suburb out of town and got to the place, but it looked dark and uninhabited. I decided to ring up the guy and ask if he could come outside, and he said yes. Waited about a minute, then two, nothing. I then wondered if I was even at the right place and thought maybe the address on the receipt was supposed to be another street nearby that had a similar name so i rung him up again to try and confirm this 
but then he became rude and abusive towards me like, Mate, you freaking turn right on so and so street. It's not hard to find, I've been waiting a freaking long time for my pizza, now hurry up. After that, I decided his place was only a minute from where I currently was. So I did the most responsible thing. I took the pizza back to the store in the main part of town. I explained what happened to my manager and he said it was fine and he'd take care of it. I then took a different delivery, customers this time were much nicer, and we never spoke of that little incident again. That initial delivery either got cancelled or delayed even further. Moral of the story is, don't mess with the people who handle what you eat. I'm not gonna lie. If I was the customer, I probably would be kind of upset if it was delayed and they were at the wrong address and asking where to go. That being said, I also wouldn't be yelling at them and cursing them out on the phone. They're just a delivery driver, I think you should try and remain as respectful as possible. Despite being, in my opinion, justifiably upset. Our next story is by PKO TTO. Bite me once, even twice, shame on you. Try for a third time and feel my baby wrath. When my children were in daycare, about 16 years ago, my youngest was around 14 to 15 months old, so she was still in the baby room. A boy who was 18 to 20 months old had started biting other children for some reason. This boy, already large for his age, should have been transitioned over to the toddler room, 16 to 18 month to 3 year olds. But his parents had not started potty training and there were other areas where he was just not developmentally ready to advance. The daycare facility had a three strikes rule for major offenses. I received two incident reports on my daughter being bitten by this boy. First time she'd been bitten on the hand and arm. Second one ruffled my feathers pretty badly because he bit her all over her back and stomach. I was ready to fight at this point and told them if it happened again, I wanted this child banned and I wanted child protective services involved because I thought it was odd that this child just all of a sudden started this behavior when he'd been a perfectly happy, affectionate, sociable child. Well, I didn't have to endure my baby girl suffering pain at the hands of this boy anymore. One of the ladies who worked the baby room told me about all this. The day after the second biting incident, the boy came at my daughter for another round. She saw him coming and grabbed one of those foam kitty couches and ran at him, plowed him over until he was underneath the couch. When she had him where she wanted him, she sat on top of him and the couch. She refused to get off, so the lady had to pick her up and take the couch off him to let him up. They wanted me to sign an incident report against her for being aggressive towards the boy. I refused, saying that she was only defending herself. They eventually agreed and tore up the report. The boy never came at my little girl again. The next week, my daughter was transitioned to the toddler room as she was developmentally advanced even though she was a bit younger than most. First off, it sucks that this kid was biting your daughter, but it's kind of funny to imagine this like war zone of babies. Little Chompers comes trotting over for round three, and all of a sudden this daughter equipped with a foam kitty couch starts charging at them, ready to take them down and stop them from their dastardly actions. Our next story is by Yellowjacket81, a hero of the working man. I used to work for a union shipping company. I was the guy who sorted the packages into which delivery truck they got loaded on. It was a decent gig for an 18 year old, but it's still basically grunt work. Managers weren't union, obviously, so they were the devil. There was this one manager, Greg, who all the union boys hated because he'd constantly short us time on our breaks and complain that we didn't work fast or efficiently enough. It got so bad that we started timing everything to ensure that we were in compliance. No matter how often we could prove we were in compliance with timings, Greg just wouldn't stop making a nuisance of himself. Well, I was just a young kid grunt on the preload, but I soon realized I had more power than anybody knew. See, several months earlier, the union reached out for volunteers for a store union safety officer. Nobody wanted this role because it's basically a shootload of extra work with very little extra pay. However, I thought it sounded cool, naive at 18, so I took the role. And did nothing with it, because I'm lazy and who freaking cares? 
did nothing with it until Greg started being a little witch all the time. Turns out that a lot of the things Greg wanted to do, whether timing related or just any old thing, would conflict with the safety regulations put in place to protect the union workers. And as the union safety officer, the responsibility to write up those violations fell to me. Ladies and gents, you best believe I studied every obscure safety guideline the company or union had and targeted Greg specifically to comply with them. Want to climb on the moving belt to get that stuck box? Sorry Greg, that requires a full electrical shutdown for safety. Gonna have to file a complaint. Greg, why aren't you wearing your hard hat when you climb the ladder to the upper storage? Have to document that. Greg, those packages are in excess of 50 pounds. You know darn well you need to get two people to lift them into the truck. Union needs to know. As hard as grown man Greg flexed, my 18 year old punk kid butt flexed back harder. After doing virtually nothing safety related for several months, I filed over 20 safety violations over the course of 14 days most of them on Greg, and where Greg could only yell and give verbal reprimands for the things he thinks we were cheating on, literally every safety violation I filed comes back to the head office for review per the terms of our union contract. Greg moved on and the beloved Sheila took his place. I can't honestly say whether I was directly responsible, but I like to tell myself I had something to do with it and the union boys bought my underage butt beer for some time to follow. You might have just been a young kid grunt on the preload, but you got equipped with the power to take down a manager that everybody at that place hated. Job-wise, you might have been on the lowest totem pole, but in every average working man's eyes that was employed there, you were at the top of that list, for sure. And our final story of the day is written by Chunky Dunkerskin. This is an oldie but goodie. Family Stuff Ahead, featuring my sister and her BFF. I was about 12 or 13 and was babysitting my sister and her friend. They were playing house and they found some empty beer cans my parents' busts finished before going out. They asked if they could play with them. I cleaned them out and let them have them. About two days later, my dad bursts into my room, screaming at me for giving a six-year-old beer. Mind you, I was still asleep when he burst in, so I was completely completely confused. Later, he showed me the empty cans in my sister's room and asked why I let them drink. I tried to explain the situation. They were empty, I rinsed them out and put water in them. He didn't believe me because my sister was so adamant about getting me grounded. Summertime. No phone, no going out, no allowance, but still had to do the chores. No pool, we had one in the yard. Two months, mostly my whole summer, grounded. To say that I was ticked off is an understatement. So, being older and wiser, I tricked her into confession. I asked my mom to stand by the kitchen window. It was open and led to our porch. I asked my sister after a bunch of small talk, why did you lie to mom and dad about me giving you beer when it was water? Her reply was, snarky face and all, so you'd get in trouble. My mom flew out of that kitchen with THE wooden spoon. This was well over 30 years ago, so this was much more commonplace than today. Sister got a spanking and grounded and I was repaid my allowance, plus some, and was allowed a pool party that weekend that I invited all the kids in the neighborhood to, including sister's friends. She watched from her room all day. Now as adults we laugh about it, but darn, kids can be straight up evil. That is a lot of punishment for something that you didn't do, especially when you're a kid. When you're 12 or 13 and you have to sacrifice your entire summer, and it's all because your sibling lied to try and get you in trouble, that would really mess me up. That would be potentially relationship damaging. I don't even care if it's when we were kids. So I'm glad the mom agreed to stand by while they got them to confess the truth. Giving away a master sergeant's golf clubs. So many years ago, I was a logistician in the United States Marine Corps. My unit was headed overseas on a little mini deployment to Morocco. I was in charge of the logistics in my unit even though I was only a corporal. 
This was because first, we didn't have a staff sergeant to run the shop, and the sergeants we had were garbage at logistics and got put to work for me. So anyways, we're gearing up to go on this little mini deployment and the master sergeant who was going to be the highest ranking enlisted comes over to my office to chat. He starts off being real cool and then eventually asks if he can bring his golf clubs in with one of our containers. I thought to myself that it would be wise to be on his good side since I was only a corporal and going on a deployment with his company, so I agreed even though it was against the rules and regulations, however everyone does it all the time. So anyways, we go to Morocco and he has his clubs. No course in sight, but he was happy hitting balls, so I didn't care. However, then everything changed. His marines didn't request to bring enough materials to build what we were there for. They start saying I'm missing a 20-foot container, which doesn't happen to me. So I finally solved the mystery. It turns out they didn't request to bring enough and left the materials behind at their office. So here we are in Africa to do a job, but we don't have enough materials. So he tries to use me as a scapegoat. Even a gunnery sergeant and a staff sergeant of his get in on this and just treat me like crap because I refuse to take the fall for their shop's freak up. This goes on for the entire two months we are there and we are in the middle of nowhere, so nothing for me to do but deal. Anyways, we start heading home and we head back to civilization, to a port and we had to clean our gear to go back to the US as per customs and biosecurity. So we are cleaning everything. Even Tank had to take tanks off their tracks and clean the tracks. It was a pain in the butt, but still a cool experience. The problem however was that the master sergeant kept needing to reopen containers that had been finished. Now the problem with this was that we had to have actual US custom agents on site and use their banding seals to seal the containers which then had to be documented with the unique serial number. Every time we had to open one, I had to beg the customs agents to open them and let us get whatever the master sergeant needed and then close it up without having to redo the cleaning. Normally, it was a solid no, but the agents were cool and we worked it out. Plus, every night I usually ran into them at the bars and I would buy them beer. It got to the point where the agents didn't even have any of their own seals left because of how many times we did it. They ended up using mine to reseal. It really made things difficult and it was often for dumb stuff. So finally, I had it. It was literally the last day we had for cleaning and of course the master sergeant wanted something else. So I asked the agents. They were really fed up with it. However, I then asked, do either of you guys golf? One of them said yes. I said then we need two containers opened. So we got the dumb stuff for master sergeant then we went to the other container where I knew the master sergeant's golf clubs were hiding. I opened the container, pulled out the clubs, and gave them to the agent. He looked at me and I just said, I don't want to hear crap about opening any more containers. He was cool with it and got it in his car. No issues from there on. Anyways, we get back to the States and the ship pulls in with the gear and we got it home no problem. A week later, the master sergeant comes in my office. He's all buddy-buddy again. He then asks where his golf clubs were. I said, my guess is your garage or your closet? He forces a chuckle and goes, haha, okay, come on dog, where's my clubs? I then said, I don't know what you're talking about, Master Sergeant. He then said, my clubs in the container. I then explained to him that per the Department of Transportation Regulation Chapter 3, I even had it down to the subchapter and paragraph letter, that no personal gear can be shipped inside of military cargo containers. He then starts getting mad and I keep repeating the paragraph. He loses it, grabs me, but my shop's gunnery sergeant got to him quick and pulled him off before he swung on me. He never did find out what I did to his clubs, and I left the unit about six months later to go to my next command. Do you guys think what OP did with the golf clubs is a bit too much just giving them away? Or do you think it was fair because the Master Sergeant was being unruthlessly annoying? Let me know yes or no and why in the comments down below. The next story is also by Mob Kurt. Sending trucks to the wrong state to screw over a Staff Sergeant. So back when I was in my first unit, we had to ship all of our 7 tons off to get up armored. That meant that over a year or so, we shipped them all from South Carolina to Wisconsin. I was in charge of logistics at the time, so I coordinated it all and loaded the trucks. 
Overall, a pretty easy task. The only challenge was the documentation. Anyways, it was all going well until this new staff sergeant showed up in the motor pool. He was a b-hole. Just treated everyone like crap. He made my life miserable when I tried to ship these trucks. Like, I didn't want to. It wasn't overly fun. Sometimes it even required me to work on weekends, so I would have been happy just not doing it. However, I had to. HQMC ordered it, so there was no reason for him to be pissy with me. Anyways, so once he took over, shipping these trucks became a pain in the butt because he would want to micromanage because I was a lower rank. So I let him and he wanted to sign stuff. So I made up lines for him to sign. So finally, I had it with him. One day, I decided since he wanted to sign and be important, I would mess him up. So when my next big shipment, like four trucks, came along, I decided that instead of sending them to Wisconsin like they were supposed to go, I would send them somewhere else. I decided 29 Palms, California would be a great location. So I changed some codes on the sheets, gave them to the tick staff sergeant who made more crap comments and signed blindly. So off we shipped those trucks. Well, a couple weeks later, the call comes in that our trucks never arrived. So the command starts getting worried that a few trucks had gone missing. They come to our shop and we just informed them that this staff sergeant had taken charge of all the shipments lately. So they go to him and he proudly said he had taken over, but crumbled when they asked him where the trucks were. It took them a couple of weeks, but finally a call from 29 Palms came into our command that they had these trucks show up, but nobody had claimed them. The command flipped their poop. As far as they were concerned, this stupid freaking staff sergeant got involved in stuff he didn't need to get involved in and sent four big B trucks across the country instead of where they needed to be. He got told to leave the logistics to the logistics department and I had the whole thing solved in an hour. When it ain't broke, don't fix it. It's a smooth, well-oiled machine and it was functioning well. Don't insert yourself into there and jam the cogs up and just completely mess the whole flow of everything up and step on people's toes. Obviously, it didn't work out for them. And our final story of the day is by Ordinary Diamond 158 how I got my boss fired when he tried to fire me. Starting out, let me explain why there wasn't a mass walkout and I am the only one that quit despite us basically being terrorized and treated like slaves. The job market was in shambles in my city at that time with something like a 40% unemployment rate. I knew someone with a doctorate degree in theoretical physics working at a local fast food joint as it was literally the only place hiring. The city had quick access to four research universities but he got downsized due to lower admission rates. He is now the dean of the physics department at his former school. To quit any job, no matter how bad, was financial suicide and a guarantee that you would not find a new one. I always worked customer service, food service, and hospitality since I was 14. At 24, I decided it was time to find a job with benefits and potential for career advancement, so I took a job stocking shelves overnight with a global monstrosity that started out as a mom and pop store. I felt right at home. I worked hard and constantly took the worst jobs and the worst days off to make sure I would be there on the weakest staffing days to rub elbows with management. If there was anything that occasionally came up that no one on the shift was trained to do, I would come in on my day off without pay to get trained how to do the task like keys, paint, accounting issues, etc., to become less disposable and more versatile. It worked, and 10 months in, I found myself with an offer to promote to low-level management starting January 1st. Starting the weekend before Thanksgiving, the overnight manager started to understaff shifts to preserve his end-of-year bonus and acted surprised when people called out. He would then bully us into staying over with the threats of write-ups for not finishing our assigned stocking tasks. Upper management was notorious for just signing off on write-ups without looking into their validity, so each staff being assigned 13 plus hours of labor to complete a loan in 6 hours, while typically it was approximately 4.5 hours to account for tending to customers as well, was no defense. 
since an employee could only get two of those write-ups in a rolling 13-month period before termination, we would all stay over as well as skip our breaks and lunches to finish. Those write-ups were also less job-threatening as he would simply turn a blind eye to us clocking out for break slash lunch and returning to work. But there was a catch. Since any approved overtime would count against his $73,000 bonus, approximately 11 cents per approved hour, he would never file the approval forms for the OT. This meant that it was considered unapproved, meaning that we were required to get approval to cut hours off our regular shifts to equal what we stayed over. He, of course, never approved us to cut those hours. This was resulting in weekly write-ups from the same manager for unapproved overtime on those of us that made it to work every day despite the weather and missed holiday get-togethers with our families. Every week we would get our write-up and he would get praised for getting everything done with less approved staffing hours than typically allocated. Thankfully, write-ups for unapproved OT didn't carry a lot of weight, but for three months they counted against your points for promotion opportunities. This went on until the week before Christmas. When I got my weekly write-up, I was told by the store manager, who offered me my promotion, I would be suspended for overtime abuse the next time my manager submitted a write-up for unapproved overtime hours. Determined not to lose my promotion, I started telling the manager no. The second time, I refused to stay over without him signing an overtime approval form and giving me a physical signed copy. Before I hit overtime, he wrote me up for abusive actions towards a member of management and actions with intent to undermine the integrity of management and store policies. This instantly cost me my promotion, which greatly upset me, and then, like the idiot he is, he left me alone in his office to sign the write-ups and the acknowledgement that I was no longer promoting. Initially, I was just going to accept it and resolve myself to spending the next 13 months working my tail off for minimum wage and go up for promotion as soon as they fell off. When I started reading the acknowledgement form, I found I was not eligible to promote to management until I was right up free for five years. This meant six years and one month before I could even try to get promoted again. All because I followed policy. So, rather than sign it, I wrote freak off in a sharpie across his brand new desk, which he got for being such a great manager, walked out of his office, handed him my vest and name tag, shredded the write-ups and tossed them into the air like confetti, and told his no longer smug face that it was now my personal mission to get him fired. He lost his cockiness when it sunk in, I'd just quit. I could see little beads of panic sweat forming on his forehead as he realized that the only person capable of performing certain highly essential functions for his shift was walking out the door. He shouted after me, telling me that he could talk to the general manager and see if he could get the time frame cut down to three years. He offered to approve all of my overtime the rest of the season, offered me a cut of his bonus, and several other offers I can't remember. Honestly, if he'd offered to withdraw the write-ups, which was still 100% an option but he never offered, I wouldn't have accepted it. But I might not have followed through on my threat. I was too angry and too determined. And I didn't care if I became homeless as long as I never had to work there again. Now, how did I get him fired? Well, due to certain ADA requirements, I was permitted to carry a voice recorder with me at work so I could record important meetings, announcements, and reminders. When I got written up the first time for unapproved overtime, I started recording his requests to both me and co-workers. I never used them to dispute the write-ups, but I never deleted them either. So I uploaded all the recordings to my computer, nearly 18 hours of audio, and sent it to the home office CCing every store manager and compliance officer in the district. When I went in for my last paycheck, he was long gone. I was offered my promotion back, but I declined. The regional director then offered me my old manager's job with a $73,000 hiring bonus. Wonder where that came from. But I still refused and said I was never returning to retail. My former manager's boss laughed and told me that everyone returns eventually, and when I did, 
come see her and she would find me a management spot somewhere. After five months of being unemployed, living with my mom and barely surviving, I moved to another state and got a job working in a state prison as a guard and I'm very fulfilled. Honestly, a $73,000 bonus? If that was me, I don't care, I would have to take it. That's some good money, honestly. But I respect the heck out of OP for staying strong with their stance and they made a promise that they were never going to work there again, maybe not work in retail ever again, and they stuck to their guns, even with $73,000 staring at them. Not a choice I would make, but more power to them. My ex-advisor plagiarized my work, so I exposed her and that cost her job. Just found out about this subreddit and had to share this story. The initial reason for the revenge happened in 2013, but the revenge only happened in 2017. I'll keep everything vague as to not be recognized. For context, back in 2013, I was a graduate student pursuing my master's degree. That was my last year in the program. We had 24 months to finish all the work and the dissertation. My advisor was a professor who was very well known and experienced on my field of work. Let's call her Janet. Fake name. Janet and I had worked together with research since my college days as I became part of an undergraduate research with her. At that point we had been working for about 4 years and as any advisor student relationship, we more had our disagreements quite often. Janet was used to doing her experiments a certain archaic way. I knew there were better uses of our grants money and always tried to push towards a more advanced method, especially correlating data collection and statistics. However, our relationship was always good. I knew her husband and had been to her house numerous times. She was a little set on her ways, but we managed to make good progress on our field. Anyhow, by the end of 2013, I presented my dissertation to the department and was approved with flying colors. My data still wasn't published in any paper as I wanted to have more analysis in different areas to make a more robust and better paper. With that said, my dissertation was published and by all reasons, that is my work and my experiments. After I got my MS, I decided to pursue a PhD. While I was still going to work in the same field, I wanted to use different techniques and thus talked with Janet about going to pursue a PhD under a different professor in another university. She always encouraged me to do better and look for ways to diversify my views. I went ahead and contacted a professor outside my country in another university to pursue my PhD. I got approved and soon moved away. For the next two years, I still kept contact with Janet, but on the third, she stopped responding. Initially, I thought she had changed her email or something, but didn't think much of it. Time flew by, and in 2017, while reading papers and writing my own, I came across a paper that was strangely similar with my research. Interested in it, I opened it up to read. For my shock, it was a paper by my ex-advisor. She was up as advisor and another guy, who from his curriculum is her current master's student. Reading the title, I thought, hey, that's neat, she continued researching it. But boy, I was wrong. Reading the paper, I got increasingly angry. That wasn't a new research. It was my research. My data was all in that paper, even my graphs and tables. Initially, I thought, oh well, she's also an author and if she is citing it, there shouldn't be a problem. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case. My name was nowhere near that paper as they claim that research as original. Now I was livid. I sent an email to Janet confronting her, which was never replied to. However, I am not a pushover and will never allow people to claim my own work as theirs. She made a mistake using my data. I'm a research and I keep everything I ever worked on saved in external SSDs encrypted and on my own possession. All cataloged with date entries and even had my own dissertation to prove my work. In my country, research is financed by the governmental grants. I wrote an email to the dean of the grants institution, explaining all the situation with proof of everything. I also sent an email to the journal in which that was published, contesting their paper and explaining everything. It didn't take longer than 15 days for me to get a follow-up. The institution responsible for the grant was furious. 
They cut all financial aid for her and her student and made a formal requirement to the university requesting her immediate termination. The journal retracted the paper and is now suing her for plagiarism. Now, after all these years, I learned that she was indeed fired and hasn't been able to get work in this field ever since. I never met her again and have no intention of ever doing so. Now, my work is published and I'm recognized by my contributions in the field. Maybe that was a petty thing to do, but I couldn't allow people to get away with claiming my work as theirs. So what do you think guys, was this too petty? Let me know if you think OP is justified in the comments down below. If you ask me personally, I think OP is completely justified. If that was my work that got ripped off and published, I'd be wanting to do the same thing too. But let me know your thoughts and if you agree. Our next story is by Tatanka Jack. My co-worker destroyed the PTA. I worked in a state senator's office with a very smart and capable mom. She was the senator's aide, but that was only for part of the year, and I'm fairly certain she didn't really have a career apart from that, but incredibly capable. This lady would always surprise me with the things she had done. Like once, she casually mentioned the time she had gone to some conference in Australia to give a speech and I was like, wait, what? My favorite thing she told me about was when she destroyed her local PTA. So, in the States, we have these organizations called parent-teacher associations. It's a national organization with local chapters for different schools. They exist to foster relations between parents and teachers, but usually just turn into lots of Karens making unnecessary rules, getting upset over stupid things, and generally causing problems. Usually staffed by the type of people who like to create and solve problems to justify their existence. Sort of like a homeowner's association for schools. Anyway, this lady was no Karen. She didn't create problems, she solved them. She hated the PTA at her children's school. It was always causing problems and had budget problems. When it finally began getting field trips and recess banned and wasting fundraising money and membership dues on administrative costs, among other issues, she decided she had had enough. She joined the PTA, worked her way through its ranks, volunteered at all the events, ran for office, and became president of the PTA. She then used the bylaws and her influence to disband the chapter. The kicker is then she created her own local club to replace the PTA. One that wasn't influenced by a national parent organization and bureaucracy. She was able to raise tons of money for awesome events, projects and trips for the students and ran the club way more effectively than the PTA had ever been. And everyone at the school lived happily ever after. Such a cool lady. Honestly, we need more people like her. The fact that there's such a problem commonly with these PTA situations, it's frankly frustrating. You want the best for your kids, you want the best environment for your kids, and it's great to see that this lady went and completely reformed this broken system and turned it into something good for the kids. And our final story of the day is by Cordero Biggs. Fiance left me due to my cancer diagnosis. I left her destitute. We dated for four years and had what I thought was a great relationship. We were both well-established professionals who both owned homes in the same neighborhood, and both with daughters in the home. Her daughter was 11 and mine was 16 when we met. We had actually planned to get married, build a house and raise the two together. We planned the house build because she had recently been diagnosed with a neurological disease that would eventually put her in a wheelchair and need something ADA friendly. During the planning stages, I began doing landscape and construction projects on our home to increase the resale value. All in, I invested roughly 30 grand USD into the home, running everything through my side construction business for tax, permitting, and resale purposes. We had a contract that payment would be made upon the sale of the home. I produced invoices for each and every project, but never pushed for payment because of the prior agreement. Fast forward six months, we're looking at property to develop and finalizing drawings on the home when I began feeling ill. I couldn't eat, constantly vomiting and passing blood. I began noticing that my abdomen looked swollen, which was odd because we were both very clean eaters and were in the gym every day. So I went to the doctor and began having tests done. 
During this time, she began having small cognitive issues, and the stress of her current position was exacerbating her condition. So, she took a $20,000 per annum cut in pay along with a lesser position inside the company. After a month or so of different tests and a biopsy, it came back that I had a golf ball sized tumor in my stomach and would need to begin chemotherapy. So I began chemo and radiation treatments, which made me, expectedly so, extremely ill. She was spending more time helping around my place on the weekends and staying over more, to the point that they were both at my home more than theirs. At this point, I suggested that we go ahead and put one of our houses on the market and move in together until the new house was built. I have great supplemental insurance as well as a long-term illness plan, so using that, coupled with the sale of one of our houses, would push us through comfortably and help ease the financial stress on her. Shortly after this discussion, she became extremely distant. Her daughter wasn't coming down and hanging out with mine anymore. She had excuses for not getting together. She quit driving me to treatments and stopped staying over. She then dropped a bomb. A sentence that will forever be burned into my psyche. I love you, but I can't see myself taking care of someone this sick in the long term, and I don't think we should see each other any longer. In a text. It broke me. I won't lie. This was the first woman I had ever opened up to and planned a life with since my wife died when my children were one and three. However, I tried to be mature about it. I forced myself to understand her position and to accept what I could not change. I calmly, the next day, gathered all of her things, packed them neatly, loaded them in my truck, and took them to her house to leave on the back porch while she was at work in order to avoid any awkward exchanges. Walking around the back and under the porch cover, I sat down on box and saw her in her back living room, on the couch, having sex with a man that she introduced to me as a lifelong friend. I had dinner and drinks with this man and his girlfriend. We had gone on vacation with them as well. I never spoke of the incident with her and simply sent her a text later explaining that I would leave her things on my side porch to pick up at her convenience. I discovered 8 or 9 months later from his now ex-girlfriend that they had broken up due to him confessing that he had been sleeping with my significant other, dating back to about the time we were finishing drawings on the new home. Now I'm pissed. Revenge time. At this point, I had finished chemo and radiation for the time being and was feeling healthier. I was going through some much neglected paperwork when I ran across the file that contained $32,680 in unpaid, long overdue invoices, which were promptly sent to my attorney to begin lien proceedings on the home. It turns out that I couldn't have done this a moment too soon because she was set to put her house on the market. Coupled with interest over the course of what was then 19 months overdue, the invoices were hefty. That, along with the agreement of settling them when the house was sold and attorney fees, left her with roughly 10 grand after the sale of the home and settling her current mortgage. She promptly had to back out of the purchase of another home and moved in with her oldest daughter, son-in-law, and two grandchildren. She also had to leave her job and begin receiving disability. I ran into her a little over a year ago and she looked as if she had aged 20 years and was in the wheelchair we had talked about. We chatted cordially but briefly and I excused myself and went on with my day. A few days later, her younger daughter called me and spoke of my running into her mom and could we hang out sometime. I gave a vague answer, thanked her for calling and again went on with my day. The ex then called me a week or so later and began apologizing for leaving me as she did. Again cordial but short. I thanked her for calling and hung up. She began texting and this went on for several weeks until one, she asked if I could ever see us rekindling what we had, to which I replied, I can't see myself taking care of someone so sick in the long term. Remember the box on your back porch? Did you think that lifelong friend brought that over to you from my house? Good luck to you. Goodbye. I sometimes feel guilt over this but not much and not often. Well, there's definitely a few things you can touch on with this story. One is that it seems OP is doing well with their chemo and the cancer situation, so it's good to hear that. Two, OP really dodged a bullet here. Even though they had to experience one of the most 
terribly resonating sentences delivered by text no matter, they really did dodge a bullet here. Somebody that cheats on you and then covers that up by saying that they don't want to be with you because you have cancer? That's the excuse they're gonna give you? The whole situation screams yikes. I'm just glad OP seems healthy, they ended up getting the money that they were owed, and they ended up finding out the truth even though it would be a very heartbreaking way to experience it, catching them the way he did when they were on the porch. Computerized harassment goes both ways. Gather round for this is a story of the liberation of the little guy. Please excuse any formatting issues as I am in mobile. I will make edits as necessary. Also, the conversations are translated from Spanish, so they may not be accurate, but the gist of the conversation is there. None of the names are real. If you don't know what a debt buyer is, then I recommend you look up John Oliver Debt Buyers on YouTube. Basically, debt buyers are companies that buy people's debts from different banks, and their entire purpose is to collect those debts. Their MO is harassment. Day zero. I get a pre-recorded call. Regarding your car loan, we have tried to reach out. You have been evasive. Drastic action will be taken. Please press 1 to call one of our operators or call number. I don't have a car and haven't taken any loans recently, so I find it weird, but I want to make sure someone didn't steal my identity. I press 1, but no one answers. I just hope they never call again. Boy, was I wrong. Day 3, I get 3 calls from their phone number, but I don't answer because I am working. I block their number. Day 4, I get another call from a phone number with the same digits except the last two. I finally pick up and get the same pre-recorded message. I press 1 and someone answers the phone. I google both of the numbers that I got called from. Turns out they are owned by a different company that sells corporate harassment technologies. They sell a multiple phone line service. This means dead buyers can call. Idiot operator says, Hello, this is Dead Lawyers Inc. Who am I speaking with? Hello, I was just wondering who you were trying to call. Can I please have your name? No, you called me. Please tell me who you are looking for. I'm looking for Aldo Aguilar. That is not me. Please stop calling me. Do you know Aldo Aguilar? I do not. Please stop calling me. How long have you had this phone line? That is none of your business. I am not Aldo. I don't know who Aldo is. Stop calling me. Okay, have a good day. So now I know no one has taken a loan with my name. I am relieved. I hang up thinking it was all over. I wouldn't be here writing this if it had been over. Day 5, I get a call from them at 9 o'clock. I start work at 9.30, so I pick up. Bueno, I thought I told you not to call me. We're calling you because you hadn't paid your car loan. Who am I speaking with? Stop calling me. I don't know who you are. You are probably a scam. Just stop calling me. You are wasting your time. We are Dead Lawyers Inc. We will stop calling you. Have a good... Me interrupting him. I want you to tell me that you will remove my phone number from your database. I am not the person you are looking for. Sir, you took out a loan with huge bank. We are a debt buyer. We have to collect this loan. Please cooperate. I can do this all day long. You either stop calling me or I will call you non-stop. I am not the person you are looking for. What do you want to do? I want to chat for a bit. What kind of adult entertainment do you like? Can I help you with something else? Are you into feet? You sound like that kind of guy that likes feet. I hear it in your voice. Sir, please stop. Can I help you with something else? Now you know how it freaking feels. Sir, can I help you with something else? Stop calling me. I can't do that. Okay, have a nice day. I go to my morning meeting and once I'm finished, I call their number. I do the same thing as the last conversation. He hangs up. I keep calling. Rinse and repeat. Sometimes I sing a song by the Fabulosos Cadillacs. Sometimes I sing a made-up song. I always ask them to stop calling me and they always say no. I tell them I am a programmer and that they are not the only ones with access to a freaking computer. Until I finally get their supervisor. Hello, my name is Idiot. I am the supervisor. How can I help you? Me, firmly, stop calling me. You are the one calling us. Don't play stupid with me. Sir, you have to pay your loan. I don't have a freaking loan. Then stop calling us. Remove me from your database. Just block our number and you'll be done with us. Do not 
play dumb with me. I know that shoot doesn't work. Are you going to remove me from your database? Sir, you have. Stop giving me evasive answers. Will you stop calling me? I am not giving you. You are giving me evasive answers. Remove me from your database now. Can I help you with something else? Stop calling me. Can I help you with something else? If you don't stop calling me, I will make a program that calls you every minute. Okay, can I help you with something else? Do you realize what you are doing? You want me to call you every minute? I am not bluffing. Can I help you with something else? Okay, you asked for it. I keep working and then I go to bed wondering how the freak am I going to make a call bot? I was bluffing. Day 7, it's finally Friday. On my lunch break, I Google Debt Lawyers Inc. They have a pretty nice website. I run a web crawler and find a couple of public forms that people can fill out. I save the URLs of the form for later, make a mental note that the site is built on a PHP framework and keep Googling. Apparently, they are utter scumbags. There is an article from a reputable newspaper, if you can actually call any newspaper in my country reputable, that listed the 14 companies with the most harassment complaints made to the government. Guess who was in there? I keep searching and I find a forum where people have posted their experiences with Debt Lawyers Inc. Apparently they called some single mother's kid and told them that they were going to lose their house and would never sleep on a bed again. Holy shoot, now I really want to annoy them. There is no better time to code than Friday night. So I call my friend Roberto, who is very well versed in the art of PHP. I offer him a six pack in exchange for his help. He accepts. I ask him if by chance he knows how to make software that can call them incessantly. Unfortunately, he does not. We get to coding but realize their website is too secure. We realize they don't have a CAPTCHA in their job application form. This is going to be fun. Roberto calls his friend Mariana who is a software testing specialist. She gives us a couple of her scripts. We made a simple script in Python that would open a browser window, fill out the job application with garbage data and send it. We put it inside a loop and each of us ran it overnight 10,000 times. 10,000 times! I am satisfied with our jobs and go to bed. Day 10, our code was pretty bad and it only ran about a thousand times before it glitched out. Still a pretty good result. I run it again and ask Roberto to also run it. Day 11, it's a lazy Sunday and I have nothing to do. I decide that if I made a promise to make a call but I might as well make one. I start looking up solutions but everything that comes up is Android or jailbroken iPhone. I have a regular iPhone so no luck. I ain't giving up that easy. I have a Python console app installed on my phone. After some Google foo, I realize there is no way to make phone calls using the app. I take one more shot and check out the Shortcuts app. I knew it can be used to automate flows in an iPhone, but I always ignored it. I open it and see I can make phone calls. This is going to be much easier than I expected. After a quick look at a tutorial, I make a loop that runs 50 times and calls them. This isn't enough since they can just never hang up and leave the bot hanging. There is no command for hanging up so I'm going to need to get creative. There is a command for turning on airplane mode and one for turning airplane mode off. So I make a shortcut that calls their phone number, waits 40 seconds, turns on airplane mode, waits 2 seconds, turns off airplane mode, waits 3 seconds and calls again. I tested it with 6 loops and it worked. I set it back to make 50 loops and put my phone away. I would call them on Monday. I decide that I won't activate the job application script or the call butt unless they called me again. Day 12, at 9 o'clock sharp, I get a call from them. Mother freakers. I wanted to give them a chance. They've lost their chance. I pick up their call, press 1, and they immediately hang up. I call them back. Someone answers, but they don't say a word. Bueno. Silence. You won't talk? Okay, I will do the talking. I told you not to call me, I told you the consequences of calling me again. It is 9.07, for the next 24 hours my robot will be calling you. At 9.07 tomorrow, I will be the one calling you. Please don't call me again after that. Idiot operator, silence, he hangs up. I ran the job application script to send 1000 applications. I open Spotify and put my favorite Mambo and Salsa playlist on full volume. 
I start the shortcut and put my phone next to my speaker. My phone is calling them every minute and blasting Celia Cruz and Buena Vista Social Club in their ears. I lower the volume and in some of the calls I can hear idiot operator trying to talk to me and asking me to stop. It's too late. After one hour of the shortcut running, I feel bad for them and decide to turn off the shortcut. I give them 15 minutes to cool off and after that, I call them. First call, they don't answer. Second call, I can barely get a word in before idiot operator hangs up. Third call, they finally listen to me. Again, idiot operator doesn't say a word. I kind of felt bad, I wanted to offer a truce. You stop calling me and my robot will stop calling you. Idiot operator has silence. If you hang up before giving me an answer, I will keep the robot running. I know you probably have metrics and these a-holes pay you based on that. You decide, next month's pay or deleting my phone number from your database. Idiot operator, silence. As you wish, I will call you tomorrow at... He hangs up. I run the shortcut. I am racking up calls like a kid with a Mountain Dew t-shirt racks up deaths in Call of Duty. 156 calls later, they finally block my number. I can't call them anymore, and I assume they won't call me back. Today, it's been five days since the call butt attacked. They haven't called me since. I am just writing this story, and I'm tasting the sweet glory of defeating these a-holes. They are misusing technology to harass people, but they are not the only people with a computer. Hope you enjoyed the story and please keep revenging on. Anybody that goes above and beyond to annoy these call scammers like this, the telemarketers like this that are only there to try and rip some money away from you that they don't actually own or deserve is a person after my own heart. I'm just trying to think of the most optimal annoying thing to put on the speaker would be. If there was a way that you couldn't have to listen to it, I would love to put some kind of like screeching sound or something that's just terribly grating. Maybe like the song that never ends from Lamb Chop or just something silly. If you had the opportunity, would you put like music? Would you put scary sounds? What would you do? Let me know what you would have blown these scammers up with in the comments below. Our next story is written by Conscious Audience One. You scared me with one of my biggest fears, so I made you go face to face with yours. Okay, so my cousin is a prankster. She likes telling jokes and one of her favorites is, during the holidays, she likes to tell me my uncle, her dad, is coming to pick me up. If I'm being honest, my uncle is not a nice man. He yells at me and everyone for everything. He lies about people to make them look bad and him look good. He makes fun of me for being overweight. He's very verbally abusive. It's gotten to the point where I've pretty much grey rocked him which is basically no contact. And her favorite prank is telling me that he's coming to pick me up to take me to family gatherings, which I usually avoid going to if he's there. And two hours in the car with him? That's literally heck. So a couple weeks ago, she lied and told me he called and he was gonna pick me up for my birthday. I felt like I was having a panic attack. I remember crying, hyperventilating. I was pacing back and forth trying to figure some way out of it. And yes, visiting him is just that bad. She started laughing. I told her that's not funny. She knows how I feel about that man. She said, don't you feel better now that you know he's not actually coming? I haven't forgotten that. It's been two weeks. I've had enough of that prank. I wanted to prank her to kind of get her back. I remembered her biggest fear. Clowns. She's been scared to death of clowns since she was a kid. So I had a friend that's over six feet tall dress up in a scary looking clown suit. I told her I got a free dinner for two coupon for my birthday to her favorite restaurant and wanted to share it with her to bait her. We left and I had my clown in place. The plan was to stop in the middle of this old rural road and stop the car at a specific spot where my friend was hiding. Everything went to plan and my friend parked his old junk car in the ditch on the side of the road. I stopped and said, we need to check it out, see if they need help. While she's looking in it and looking around for the owner, I sneak back to my car. My clown runs out of an old barn and strayed for us. She saw him, froze and started screaming. She ran to my car but I sped off before she could get in. I didn't abandon her, I just drove over to a hill where she couldn't see me from where the old car was and watched in my rear view mirror. 
She tried running from the clown chasing her, screaming for help. He caught up to her and she got on her knees and started crying. He laughed and revealed it was a joke. I drove back and started laughing with him. She told me that wasn't funny and I repeated what she told me. The, don't you feel better line. She screamed and yelled the whole car ride at me that I could have scared her to death. I told her that's how I feel when she tells me about my uncle. So she finally got her taste of medicine. Let me ask you guys, this is very simple. Do you think OP is justified in what they've done here? Now obviously in the end, nobody really got hurt and the only person was the cousin who got absolutely rattled. Knowing that the cousin repeatedly mentions that the uncle is going to come pick OP up, and that makes OP hyperventilate, have a panic attack, freak out, and they express that it's not okay and nothing is ever done about it? The cousin probably had it coming in my own opinion, but let me know what you think. And our final story of the day is written by Clapper246. Neighbor's parents' car was blocking our drive, so we moved their car. Title sounds very vanilla, but I can promise it's rather exciting. A year or two ago... I, 21-year-old male, was living with two of my friends. We had the ground floor of the flat and a similar aged couple had the top floor. Their space was completely separate but we crossed paths most days and became good friends. Until the guy's parents moved nearby. Let's call him Jay. So Jay's parents moved to the area, a mile or so away, into a nice big house with a pool, big garage, etc. They also had plenty of cars their favorite being a 2000 Porsche 911 convertible. Every Sunday, Jay's parents would visit for Sunday lunch. They would stay inside for two to three hours and then go for a walk together before leaving. So the whole stay was close to six hours. Every week, Jay's parents would park their Porsche in the driveway but completely block the access for anyone else. When it first happened, we made them aware and asked them not to do it again. They said, it's only a few hours, we're sure you'll cope. So if we knew we wanted to drive somewhere on a Sunday, we would have to park out on the pavement which was a 5 minute walk or so. Until one blistering hot Sunday. As always, Jay's parents parked up the Porsche, but due to the heat, they left the roof down. So we hatched a plan. We knew they would be inside for a few hours, so my two housemates and I released the handbrake of the car and pushed it out of our driveway. There was no steering lock. We then proceeded to push the car the full mile back to Jay's parents' house, open the garage using the automatic controller left in the glove box, and then park the car inside the garage where it would be. We then ran home and continued our Sunday. This took roughly an hour. As we were chilling back in our flat, Jay started frantically banging our front door, shouting about how the car had been stolen. When we answered, he asked if we had seen anything before they called the cops. Turns out his parents were already calling the cops and had accused us of doing something, knowing how we hated them parking there. The cops arrive and ask for statements, etc. We tell them we have been inside the whole time and didn't see anything. The cops drive Jay's parents home where, lo and behold, they find the Porsche back in the garage. Jay's parents have no explanation. The cops think they've gone nuts and left. We cry with laughter every time we think of it happening. You may think we went out of our way to move the car, but it was worth it. Edit. We lived in the poorer part of town compared to the parents, but because we had a driveway, they didn't mind leaving the Porsche. They are now concerned about the safety of leaving a car, so they either watch or Uber. That is an incredible amount of effort to put into a revenge. That being said, all I can really say is if I was in that situation, I would be freaking out the entire time that they saw, they noticed, or that we weren't back yet and they realized that the car was missing, because although nothing happened, it very easily could have turned into a real legal issue. I sued my boss because he fired me for wanting to attend a concert. During my gap year between studies, I decided to work for Company N. Company N was run by a husband, Dave, and wife, Karen, with their son and basically treated their staff like a small family. All was well for about two months until I realized I had to ask for a day off since I wanted to attend the last Slayer concert the band would give in my country. There was about a month to go so I sent an email asking for the day off and explaining why. This is where everything started to go downhill. 
I got a reply from the Karen and her reply was weird. She stated that that's not how asking for a day off works. I was confused to say the least. Not sure what to do, I thought she wanted a more formal way of asking. So I wrote a formal email asking for the day off. She shot an email back that said I really had to think it through what I was doing, which made even less sense to me. But I was hopeful since I never really got a specific no. The next workday rolls around. I arrived, locked up my bike, and headed inside ready for work. I immediately started looking for Dave to ask for answers. Before I could even open my mouth, he asked me, Do you still want to go to that concert? I didn't expect him to ask this, so I quickly answered yes. The only thing he said back was, Okay, take off your vest and you can go home. I was stunned, and while the words started to sink in, I looked at my colleagues which were just preparing for opening. When it finally sank in, anger flowed in. I am not a confrontational person, so I simply took off my vest and gave it to Dave. Without a word, I left and started biking home. When I got back home, I told my mother what had happened. We started sending emails for extra information and got very Karen-like emails back. After a couple emails which went basically nowhere, I looked up the laws for immediate dismissal. After reading up about it, I learned that in my country, somebody can only be immediately fired when caught stealing, frauding, the person isn't able to do the work or refusal to do the work. I did neither of these. A day or two later, I met with my attorney and began the steps to sue the company N. I told my lawyer what happened in detail and he was very confident I was in my right and she was not. So after trading even more emails between the three of us, we went to small claims. I came prepared in a suit with my attorney in tow. And Karen showed up alone. I guess she assumed she won because she thought she was in her right. The trial began and I was as professional and objective as I could be. Karen did the same. Well, for about half of the trial. When she realized evidence was piling up against her, she resorted to calling me a spoiled brat, among other things I don't know the English translation for. I'm safe to say that was the point the judge ruled in my favor. As per usual, I had to wait a month before I got the verdict black on white in the mail, but I won. It may have taken about six months from the moment I was told to go home to the point those six months of pay were transferred to my bank account, but it was 100% worth it. In the end, I went to the concert. It was the most awesome and most profitable concert I have ever been to in my life. I don't even understand why saying that you want to go to this concert is grounds for firing anybody. Was it because they thought Slayer was the devil or something? Usually I'm able to come up with some kind of speculation as to why somebody did some stupid activity, such as firing somebody over wanting to go to a concert, but I just, I don't, I'm not able to wrap my head around it. That said, here's a fun question for you guys. Is there any band or singer or any musician out there that would make you more than happy to quit your average satisfactory job? If there is, let me know who the musician or the band is in the comments down below. Our next story is by Odgenator. Bully me? Fine, but I'll start a fire as I leave. The title is meant as a metaphor. There was not a literal fire. I wish I had though. I worked at a Fortune 500 company for almost a year and a half. I won't name names, but it was a shady company to say the least. I started in their quality department, but I was literally fired for being too quality for the quality department because I would report sales agents that were forcing crying retirees into making a purchase. So they moved me to the business verification department so I could instead make these customers happier with their purchase. I'm sorry to say I was far too good at this job as well. I got constant kudos from the quality department that I always hit my marks. I was always verified and corrected information, followed procedure to a T, and even took on several extra projects just to help out, including preparing and sending gifts out to our higher volume customers on behalf of the sales reps. I was always on time, I was friendly with everyone, and yet I didn't quite fit in. As a matter of fact, only one person on this team was someone I could talk to. 
The others were all mid to late 30s with kids and husbands or ex-husbands. Best way to describe them, it's the Heathers that grew old and hated it. They would constantly bully me. I don't mean tease, I mean they would joke about forcing me to work in a broom closet. They would report me for cell phone use even though cell phones were allowed, just no recording or video calling since we would verify card and address information verbally. They would deliberately leave me out of company food orders and celebrations, and even convince the manager not to promote me and instead promoted someone who had been there less time with worse quality only because she fit in better. She'd literally cost the company money shipping product to the wrong address multiple times and still was promoted within the department. They would also berate me for the state of my desk. I will say I don't keep a super clean desk, but we are not consumer facing and it was my organized chaos. It wasn't old food or trash, just a general scattering of notes and trinkets that never overflowed past my desk. The real juice here though was about four months into this position, I started documenting all the bullying. Every instance, every word, with a date and time and often a reference within the company's system for where to locate proof of the bullying, all on those little notepads. Well, one day I come back from lunch and they had gone through my desk to clean it, going so far as to move my trinkets and pictures around on my desk. I took everything home that day, but I know they'd actually been after my notebooks. Thankfully, I'd just had to buy a third one. I filled the first two up, so it was mostly empty. The final straw came on a fateful February afternoon. It was a Thursday. One coworker I got along with and I had been texting back and forth, mostly Craigslist ads for job openings and funny memes to get us through the day. Because remember, phones are allowed. She goes to lunch as I'm coming back and I get called into their lawyer's office. Me and my one and only friend were being given formal write-ups. Why? Direct quote, Your coworkers know you are texting about them and laughing and they don't like it. So I was getting a write-up because of an assumption that they had no proof of to begin with and wasn't even remotely true. The topper of this was as I exited the write-up, one of them was FaceTiming her husband, which was against the rules, but of course, she wasn't even spoken to about it. I was done. Beyond done. I put my head down, barely worked the rest of the day. When I got home, I texted my manager and let her know I was using PTO and I'd be out Friday. I spent the whole weekend working on my resignation because I wanted it to be just right. You see, I'd have been there a year and a half at that point and I knew a few things about how this shady company operates by now. I knew on Thursday this was going to be my first time ever to quit a job and I wanted to do it right. I wrote in there specific details of the bullying. Dates, times. I mentioned I had many more examples documented. I wrote how it was a known behavior and even condoned by the manager. I wrote about the write-up. Then, after many critiques, I saved it as a draft. I walked in on Monday morning, 8 a.m. on the nose. I didn't bother clocking in, and I'd already cleaned out my desk, remember? I sat down, printed two copies of my email, and then sent it directly to the CEO. I of course dropped off a copy with HR and then walked out. Not a word to my manager, only my one friend knew the plan. You see, I knew they'd snuff out the fire if I said anything to them about why I quit. Sweep it under the rug. Oh well, one more person who quit. By involving the CEO, I eliminated that as an option. In 30 minutes, their lawyer was calling me for an exit interview. They were worried I would sue for a hostile working environment. In hindsight, I should have, but I was more worried about my mental health than monetary compensation. I found out from my friend that I had in fact started that fire. The whole department was put under review for bullying, cell phones were completely banned, and the manager and her lackeys, last I heard, had been demoted. I also heard whispers that they dissolved it completely and merged it with the quality team, but I'm not positive on that. I'm sure it didn't fix everything, but I hope they at least keep their hands out of other people's desks from now on. 
Yeah, I definitely think OP had a case to have a lot more go on than just a little reshuffling of the decks. Just the fact that they went through your desk and your personal belongings and shuffled that stuff around and clearly took something, that alone should have been enough to have something happen. Constant bullying to the point where you filled two notebooks and started on a third? That's a very easy lawsuit. And our final story of the day is by Deadlock1989. Pass me for manager promotion and hire your useless credit stealing friend, I'll destroy your career. So this is not my story. Got permission to post from the pro revenger himself. But due to nature of events, I don't mind my account being made into a sacrificial lamb if it got back to people involved, as my account is essentially expendable. So the story. Dave, not real name, has been working for an IT programming company for just over 9 years, getting a good rep as a hard worker and all his colleagues knew him and can trust him to be a big help in times of trouble, like during big difficult projects for major clients. Dave's manager, John, was planning to retire and thought Dave would be a good replacement, so put his name forward as a recommendation and started showing him the ropes of his potential new job just to give him a glimpse of what he may be asked to undertake. A month later, John puts in his notice of retirement and Dave's department manager, Michael, starts the interview process. Some character info. Whilst John was a good manager, very people friendly, Michael was not. All Michael cared about was numbers and reports. He didn't even know who most of his staff was, nor did he have very much interaction with them. Back to the story. Michael had started the interviews to fill John's position. Dave being one of the interviewees and Dave thought the interview went really well. A few nervous months later, Michael announces the new manager. It's an outside employment, not an internal promotion. Dave was disappointed but brushed it off as, there is always someone better for the job. But in less than a week, he realized just how wrong he was. The new manager, Darren, was below useless. He didn't know how to spell computer program, let alone write one. Turns out he was old friends with Michael and Michael had helped him fabricate his resume to get him the job. The news quickly spread to all the programmers but there was nothing they could do as Michael was the person all complaints had to go through and he buried all of them. So no one above Michael knew of Darren's incompetence. Darren from day one had been pushing all his work onto others and then claiming credit for the work they had done, getting bonuses for completed work he didn't deserve. Darren spent his days watching movies, napping, playing games and occasionally pretending to be a manager when the need arose but never wrote a single line of code. After three months of this, the extra workload was starting to affect Dave and others but talking to Michael would do nothing, so Dave devised a plan to sort it out. Time for the pro revenge. Dave had talked with all the other programmers and agreed, next time Darren pushed a major project onto them, to purposely sabotage the work, not in a big way, just enough to cause some bugs and glitches that will really light a fire under Michael and Darren. It took about another month, but a really big project came in. Immediately, Darren started pushing his work onto others and stealing credit, so the plan was put into action. It was easy to accomplish, especially as Darren had no clue about coding, and Michael didn't care as long as the project was done in good time. The project was done, saved and sent to the client, with almost all the major work credit being stolen by Darren. It took less than two days for the client to call back complaining about how the new program has damaged his systems and was wrecking havoc on his company. The client wanted it fixed and a full refund. The bosses were pissed at Michael. Michael tried to shift the blame onto Darren. Darren tried to shift the blame onto the programmers. Dave and the programmers just pointed out the program wasn't their project and denied any involvement in its development which brought the attention back to Darren. The fallout. With the bosses coming down on Darren for what happened, he confessed he lied on his resume, and he read it out Michael about how he helped him fabricate it. Dave and programmers denied any wrongdoing, just stating Darren must have damaged the program somehow. Michael and Darren were promptly fired and replaced. Dave and the rest fixed the errors that Darren had created, and the client was happy. 
In the end, Dave didn't get the promotion, but left the company a year later for a better job. Yep, I feel no ounce of remorse for Darren here. You're gonna lie, fabricate your resume, and get a job that's cushy, you're not doing anything, and you're pushing all your work onto the shoulders of other people? Personally, I'm not showing any molecularly sized piece of remorse for this dude. Clearly, he was a bad person, he did some crappy stuff, and in the end, he was made to look like a fool. Cross post from Nuclear Revenge, standing up to my workplace bully led to unforeseen consequences. I work in the UK for a large technology company doing software support. I'm part of a team that has members all over the world. I've been in this job for around 10 years, and other than the major issues I've had with this guy, I truly enjoy my job. When I started with the company, I wouldn't say that I was green. I had about 7 years industry experience under my belt. I was definitely inexperienced with the company, but the job that I had been hired to do used technologies that I was more than comfortable with. The point I'm trying to convey here is that I wasn't completely oblivious to all of the applications supported by our company. Everyone on my team, around 30 of us, was very nice and was very keen to help, except for Shane. Shane is probably what you'd term as the team guru. About five years from retirement, part of the office furniture metaphorically as we are all home workers. He'd been with the company for nearly 40 years. Everyone labeled Shane as the only guy to go to when you're truly in a bind. When I was initially starting out, I did indeed find that Shane was highly knowledgeable and more often than not had the answers to whatever obscure questions you might have. Things were great and our team ticked over nicely. I got to know the rest of the team well, over phone, over time too. And my best friend was a woman named Mel. She was of a similar age and experience level to Shane, and in my opinion, was just as knowledgeable as him. One day, Mel and I were on a brief call chatting about a work issue when we got to shooting the breeze for a while. We talked about ourselves and also the team. I'd said that I hadn't met anyone face to face yet, and that was when she told me she'd once met Shane in person a couple of years ago. They are both based in the US. I'm in the UK and both got invited to a tech conference in New York. She told me that he has serious health issues due to his weight, around 450 pounds, and when he was home was often on oxygen and medication. His plan was to ride things out until he was able to take early retirement so that he didn't need to worry about paying for his medical insurance anymore. That sounded like a reasonable enough plan to me, and we were soon talking about something else. The issues started about two years into my tenure with the company. We started moving in a new direction with what applications we were going to be offering to customers, and towards that end, we were trained in a bunch of new stuff. I saw this as a great opportunity and equalizer. If no one on our team had any experience with this new software, then I would be on equal footing with everyone. This went really well for me, and I put a lot of time and effort into learning as much as possible. Shane didn't show much interest in the new stuff. He still continued to spend most of his time with the legacy tools. In team meetings, you could clearly tell he was getting pissed off that his status as a guru was gradually becoming more and more meaningless. This wasn't anything personal. We work in software. You have to adapt in order to remain competitive. As time went on, it was becoming clear to the team how much work I was putting in and I was well on the way to becoming the go-to guy for the new software. During this time, Shane would start sniping at me for anything he could plausibly manage. For example, if I was late to a team meeting because a customer call overran, he'd make sure to interrupt whatever was being said to comment something like, Oh look, OP has bothered to grace us with his presence. Even though he'd been guilty of the same in the past. Things like email chains too. Almost anything I sent out that included him and our boss on an email, he would reply with some unrelated complaint or observation, completely irrelevant to what was actually being discussed. One day, Mel called me and asked me what my beef with Shane was. I truthfully told her that I had no beef at all with him, and he just seemed to have it in for me. She said that if she managed to find anything out, she'd let me know. Things continued like this for a couple of years. 
I continued to be the go-to guy and he continued to try and discredit me and generally paint me in a bad as light as possible. One day we had a major incident. One that literally could have cost the company millions in SLA fines if it was not solved quickly. Our manager split us into teams to troubleshoot specific areas, and she paired me up with Shane. I wasn't happy about it, but whatever, I was a professional. We got on a call and started working through the issue. As our call progressed, it was becoming abundantly clear why he didn't like me. He knew nothing about the new application. He hadn't done any work at all. Everything I asked him to check, he needed hand-holding, even for the most basic of tasks. Eventually, I just shared my screen and said for him to watch me. I went into the guts of the system, through so many logs, explaining to him what I was doing the whole time, and eventually found the problem was with a recent patch we had installed. At this point, he dropped from the call. I didn't think anything of this at the time. We use Skype for business, and it can be flaky. So I just continued what I was doing. Our process was not to roll back any changes until it had been approved by the senior manager. As I was the one responsible for deploying and rolling back patches, made some notes about what we needed to do, and then rejoined the main call. I wasn't worried at all because bad patches happened every so often. They just didn't usually have this level of impact. As soon as I did, I got absolutely destroyed by the incident manager. Apparently, Shane had returned to the group call and informed everyone present that the outage was caused by an error that I had made in the deployment process and that Shane had told me what the correct fix was and I had refused to implement it then and there. I was furious. He had accurately told them the cause of the problem because it was me who literally demonstrated to him how to find it. I had even foolishly mentioned to him what I thought would fix the problem. Because of how long he'd been with the company compared to me, only our immediate team knew the truth about who was really the better skilled person in the situation. But historical reputation still carried a lot of weight with people who didn't work day to day with him. Because this incident was so major, over 100 people were on this call, several of them two or three levels of management above our team. He made me out to be a reckless, incompetent idiot, and he was believed. Despite my manager's protestations, I was disciplined and given a verbal warning. He, meanwhile, was congratulated for steering the company away from a potential disaster and given a commendation. I was so angry, and a while later, Mel gave me a call. Apparently, Shane had been bragging to her about putting that smart butt punk in his place. She was shocked and asked him what he was talking about. His real beef was that he thought I had disrespected him by trying to take over his role as go-to guy for the new software. That wasn't my intention at all. I didn't see it as my fault that he was too darn lazy to do the work again. I lamented with Mel that she should have recorded the call. She laughed and said that Skype shows when you're recording a call and he'd have never have spilled his guts while being recorded. I immediately had a brainwave. I decided that I would confront Shane one-on-one. I pinged him on Skype and said that I wanted to talk. He responded with a smiley and just said sure. I called him and let him know that I was recording this call. And the Skype notification popped up to let all participants know that this call was being recorded. I went right for it and accused him of lying about the major incident and said that it seemed like he had a major beef with me. As expected, he lied and said that he was sorry that I felt like I had to react this way. He said that he would need to talk to our boss about it. I said wait one second and turned off the Skype recorder. I then said that Skype isn't recording and that he knew exactly what he had done. His mask slipped at this point and he said that he was perfectly in his rights to put me in my place. He said that you need to respect the longer serving people in jobs like this and that he would do it again in a heartbeat. I didn't hold back. I called him a dinosaur who refused to move with the times and wanted to coast out his days here without doing any work. He said that he was a couple of years away from retirement and he'd be darned if he was going to bust his butt for some shiny new software. I said to him, speaking of new software, has he heard of OBS? Of course he hadn't. And I suggested he Google it. I then hung up on him. 
Not long after, the messages started. He was begging me not to use the secret recording that I had taken. He said that if he gets fired, he will lose his retirement package and his medical benefits. I told him to go freak himself and that he should have considered that before trying to get me fired. I passed all this on to the relevant channels before really giving it any thought. Things set in motion, and sure enough, a few weeks later after a company investigation, he was fired. I heard from Mel that he had asked to take early retirement so as to keep his benefits, but this was apparently rejected. So, this very quickly becomes a very difficult situation. Imagine this is you. Very obviously, Shane tried to throw you under the bus and basically get you fired from the job and paint you as an incompetent idiot. That said, if this is you and you know very well that if you report this secret conversation, they will very likely lose their job, lose their Medicare, and be at risk of very serious issues, would you still go through with reporting it? Let me know what you would have done in the comments down below. For me, it would be a decision that really kind of tore me up inside because this is an older guy that is 450 pounds or whatnot, and reporting them and having them lose all their benefits and job and money, that would lead to a situation where you can kind of see the writing on the wall as to what the actual outcome would be, as far as health goes. That said, our final story of the day is by Val Pal Joy. Teacher wouldn't let me use the restroom. I got her suspended. The title explains it. To preface, I have Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. This qualifies me as disabled and so starting when I first got sick in high school, I was required accommodations by state law. Being disabled was hard and pretty complicated since after being diagnosed with IBD, I started getting various other health issues ranging from kidney issues to neurological issues to fibromyalgia. My school was very reasonable and even after missing three months when I was first diagnosed, I still got all of my credits. The following year, I was doing all right. Then, second semester, one of my teachers left and the new one was a complete monster. She refused to teach with the textbook and used Wikipedia instead. Wouldn't give us any tests or practice for the AP exam we were due to take. I was very frustrated and felt unprepared. She absolutely loathed me since I had a little pink pass that allowed me to take my meds in class, go to the nurse as needed, and have unlimited restroom breaks. She thought I was a disruption. I would do my best to wait until she was done talking unless I was in too much pain, but she would always roll her eyes and groan at me. One day, I had just gotten in from a doctor's appointment and rushed into her class. I asked to go to the restroom and said I'd be right back. She said no. Well, asking is just a formality. All of the teachers get emails about the disabled students and know about their accommodations. So I told her, I need to go to the restroom, I'm going. As I left, she groaned something about me always wasting class time and faking it. I picked up my stuff and took it with me. I went to the restroom. Then I went downstairs to my dean's office. I signed in and when he came out to get me, I told him about her attitude and how she refused to let me use my accommodations, so I came here. I simply told them that they should let her know that she's required to let me leave the class for a reason and I have medical paperwork to back that up. He apologized profusely and called the teacher. He told her that he was sending a substitute to her room and he wanted to speak with her. Then he called for a substitute teacher on his walkie talkie. She arrived at his office looking very displeased to say the least. He sent me out of the room and I waited in the lobby for I think 20 minutes. Once she left, he had her stop at the desk to fill out some paperwork. He brought me back into the office to fill out paperwork too about what had happened. A few other students who heard what had happened came in as witnesses and after that, she was gone for three weeks. To my knowledge, she was suspended because she opened them up to a potential lawsuit. Blatantly denying a disabled student their accommodations is against the law here, and the school didn't tolerate it one bit. I will admit I do feel a little bad, but I don't take any shoot when it comes to my body and my diseases. One thing I definitely get very frustrated over hearing is teachers that deny kids the ability to go to a restroom. I get that it's excessive, but that little pink pass is given to them for a legitimate reason. 
They can't assume that somebody's trying to be a disruption or faking it or getting out of class a lot. They're not able to comprehend what it's like to have to deal with these diseases. It's just so insensitive. It makes you feel bad for having legitimate issues that you shouldn't feel bad about. So, personally, I feel no remorse over the teacher getting three weeks off. And knowing how badly teachers are paid, I would imagine it is unpaid, but if it isn't, it should have been. Newly hired youth minister got me kicked out of church for no reason. I found out he had been screwing a deacon's wife and I helped the deacon ruin his life. About six to seven years ago, I was a ministerial student at a Baptist college. I had attended the same Baptist church since I was a small child. It was large, about a thousand members, but not a mega church. This church had been an enormous part of my life for as long as I could remember. I played piano for youth choir, preached at the children's church service, which was held in the church's chapel at the same time as the adult service, drove the church bus to pick up unchurched children, etc., and ad infinitum. I did all of this for free, not even getting reimbursed for expenses. During my senior year in college, we got a new Minister of Music, Education, and Youth. This guy was as charming as an ice cream sundae with razor blades in it. I'll call him Mr. Charming. All of the deacons and their wives thought he walked on water. He was an authoritarian a-hole. In his first meeting with the church youth group, he announced that he had been hired to straighten out the youth group. One of his favorite sayings was, When I tell my disciples jump, the only questions they get to ask are how high and how far. The adults loved him and the youth hated him. Within a few weeks, half of the high school and college students, an example, all of those without parents in the church, had quit coming to church. Most youth directors would have gotten into trouble over this, but he had the audacity to proclaim, in front of the entire congregation in the Sunday morning worship service, that he had eliminated all of the thorny ground from the youth group, a reference to the parable of the sower in the Bible. And the pastor and all of the deacons loved him for it. He didn't waste any time going after what he really wanted, the pastor's job. The pastor, who I'll call Pastor T, was about 60 years old. Within a few weeks of Mr. Charming's arrival, rumors started circulating about Pastor T's health. He was an avid runner and cyclist, and that he just didn't seem to be as mentally sharp as he used to be. He frequently quoted long Bible passages from the pulpit entirely from memory without misstating a single word, sometimes in Greek or Hebrew. Worst of all, however, was the accusation that he was really too liberal for the church. Any Baptist will tell you that it is the kiss of death to even be suspected of being a liberal. None of these accusations made any sense, but people kept talking about them. I have no idea why the pastor didn't find out, or maybe he did find out and was just too scared to do anything about it. This was a Baptist church. In some denominations, like Catholic or Methodist, the denomination assigns pastors and priests, not Baptists. Each church calls the minister. This guarantees that every pastor always walks a razor's edge. The slightest slip and you're out. You don't even have to slip. Maybe you even do the right thing and it still offends enough people. It doesn't take many, it's just a handful if they hate you enough. Then you're out. Or maybe, like Pastor T, some creep just lies about you and gets your job. And since the church often owns your house, the parsonage or manse, your entire family is suddenly homeless and destitute. Then I became a target. I still don't know why. A couple months after starting to work for my church, Mr. Charming called me and informed me that my services were no longer needed at youth choir, children's church, bus ministry, anywhere. In fact, he said he did not even want me to participate in any of these functions at all, not even go to Sunday morning worship service. I later found out that members of his family had been hired by the church at very nice rates of pay to perform these functions that I had been doing for free. His wife got paid more for playing a beat-up piano at the one-hour youth choir rehearsal than the main organist slash pianist got for playing the adult choir rehearsal plus Sunday mornings and Sunday evenings when the youth choir sang. The wife could barely pick out the notes on a piano. This lady radiated bitterness, resentment, and repressed anger, but she barely said anything. She just sat there and glared, which was somehow even creepier than when she spoke. I was very hurt, emotionally. 
So I dropped by Pastor T's office and tearfully asked him what I had done wrong. I couldn't get a straight answer except he told me that people are saying things about me and that if I wanted to get a good recommendation from him to our denomination's Baptist minister school, I'd better shut up and do what you're told. So I started asking all of my church friends what people were saying about me. Everyone, everyone said, well, I didn't want to tell you and I don't believe it, but here's what I heard. According to the rumor mill, I had gotten my girlfriend pregnant and forced her to have an abortion. I hadn't even had a girlfriend since junior high, and I'd been arrested for possession of marijuana, and my dad had to pay a bunch of money to hush it up. I don't even know what pot looked like. There were other rumors, but you get the idea. I did what Pastor T told me to. I never darkened the door of that church again. Except once, months later, see below. It hurt like heck. I'd have devoted my life to that church since I was a little kid, but I had to have Pastor T's recommendation to get into the minister school I wanted to go to, and the pain was unbearable just driving by there, so I decided to keep my distance. But I started thinking about Mr. Charming. Anyone who was that evil had to have a past, and it probably wasn't a good one. I knew that, just before working for my church, he had worked at a large Baptist church in a small town about 50 miles away. That church was actually about twice the size of my church. So he had moved from a big church to the same job at a smaller church. A bad career move? Running away from something? Ah, there was something rotten in Denmark, and it smelled like an opportunity for me. As luck would have it, one of my uncles and his family lived in that same small town, although none of my family attended Mr. Charming's former church. So I called one of my cousins, told her my story, and enlisted her as a co-conspirator. I'll call her Anne. The next Sunday morning, Anne and I attended Sunday school and morning worship at Mr. Charming's old church. Although Anne had never been a member of that church, it was a small town where everyone knew everyone, so she knew most of the people there. She started asking about Mr. Charming and got an earful. Every one of her friends said that Mr. Charming was a world-class creep. He would flirt with and even make suggestive comments to all of the girls in the youth group, even those in junior high. He was 40 plus years old and had a wife and three children of his own. And then there was the touching. Never anything obvious or illegal, but he loved to put his hands all over the young ladies whenever their parents weren't around. But just like at my former church, the adults loved him because he kept the youth in line. Our investigation went on for several weeks. After church was over, we would go to her house, have a delicious Sunday lunch cooked by my aunt, and then write down everything we had learned. By then, Anne's whole family were in on my investigation. They were as angry as I was about the way I'd been treated, and our weekly report made interesting lunchtime conversation. Within a few weeks, I was sure that all I had to do was drive a few of those young ladies and their parents, friends of my aunt and uncle, down to my old church, let them tell their stories to the parents of a few girls in the youth group, and Mr. Charming would become Mr. Unemployed. But it kept getting better and better, so I kept digging. And I really wanted to keep a low profile if I could, because I didn't want to piss off Pastor T any more than I had to. He knew a lot of people in the denomination and he could easily ruin my ministerial career before it even started. Finally, after a month or so, Anne grabs me by the sleeve and said, You've got to hear this. She introduced me to a well-dressed, very large guy, maybe 30 to 35 years old. I'll call him Fred. We slipped off into a Sunday school room where we could not be overheard. It turned out that Mr. Charming had had a multi-year affair with Fred's wife. Fred had kept his cool when he found out, talked with a lawyer, and had spent months gathering evidence. Text messages, voicemails, emails, even photos and videos with Fred's wife and Mr. Charming in them. Apparently, Mr. Charming got stimulated by watching videos of himself doing the wild thing with Fred's wife. Then Mr. Charming would send the videos to Fred's wife, and they both would have cyber while texting with each other. Later, they would hook up the old-fashioned way and make more videos. Finally, Fred confronted his wife. She denied everything, but the evidence was just too much. Fred told her he wanted a divorce, full custody of the children, their house, his retirement money, his business, her engagement and wedding rings, 
everything, even the dog. She hired a lawyer, but laws and courts being what they are in this rural Alabama county, her lawyer told her that if the judge saw the videos, she'd be lucky if she ended up in a homeless shelter with all of her worldly possessions under her bunk in a garbage sack. Then Fred turned his attention to Mr. Charming. Fred still sincerely loved his wife, and he was convinced that Mr. Charming had deliberately ruined his marriage, taking Mr. Charming to court, suing him for loss of consortium, and otherwise making him legally miserable would take too long. This is Alabama. Many Alabamians prefer a more direct approach. In rural counties, the police and any jury of your peers will probably include people who have known you since kindergarten. So if you have good reasons for your actions and you aren't too stupid about it, there are things you can do. Fred scheduled an appointment with Mr. Charming in his church office, who did not suspect a thing because Fred was a deacon and his children were in the church youth group. Remember that I said Fred was big? Six foot six inches at least, 300 pounds, and if there was an inch of fat on him, he hit it well. It looked like he could pull up a 100-foot oak tree by the roots without breaking a sweat. Fred told me that he brought several friends with him and, of course, the videos. One friend locked the door. Another unplugged the phone. A third one stood behind Mr. Charming and encouraged him to stay seated in his chair. Fred made Mr. Charming watch about 10 minutes of one of the videos, then calmly said, I'm going to stand here and watch you pack up your stuff, then you're going to walk out of this building and never show your freaking butt in this town again, or we'll be back. Mr. Charming did as he was told. A month later, he had a new job at another church. My old church and started ruining another whole set of lives, including mine. Fred actually did not know where Mr. Charming had gone. He assumed that he had moved out of state. He was surprised and gratified to learn that this scumbag was only 50 miles away. This had all happened just a few months before. Fred was still deeply in love with his wife. They were getting counseling and he hoped that they could save his marriage. But his hatred of Mr. Charming was still fulminating. Like Mount St. Helens a few minutes before the explosion, he presented such a face of restrained rage and vindictiveness that it scared me and I wasn't even the one he was mad at. The next day, Monday, I drove back up there and gave him a copy of the directory of my old church. It had home addresses, phone numbers, and email addresses for pretty much every member of the church. I showed him the pages that listed all of the deacons and other church leaders, and I marked some of the church's major financial donors. I explained my situation with Pastor T and asked that my name not be mentioned. No problem, he said. The next Sunday, I could not resist visiting my old church to see how things were going. Mr. Charming was nowhere to be seen, nor was any explanation given about what had happened to him. One weird thing though, the pastor looked scared crapless. His voice, usually resonant, loud and almost musically baritone, trembled during the whole sermon. I slipped in just before the service started and made a point of sitting in the very front row, center pew. The look on his face when he saw me was worth all of my trouble. I didn't know it at the time, but Fred had gotten right to work and done a very thorough job. The whole church had gotten multiple anonymous emails with photos and videos of Mr. Charming and Fred's wife in various, well, compromising positions and states of undress. Deacons and major donors got emails plus express mail packages just for good measure. Mr. Charming and Pastor T had been left out. They didn't know anything until the phone call started pouring in. After the worship service, it did not take long for my church friends to figure out why I was there. It was very gratifying. I was something of a hero, although I kept swearing that I had no idea what they were talking about. Things continued to blow up in my former church for months afterwards. Both Pastor T and the pastor of Mr. Charming's old church almost lost their jobs because they had lied to my old church's committee of deacons who had recommended hiring Mr. Charming about why Mr. Charming had left his old job. But somehow they managed to stay in the pulpits at their churches, although a lot of church members left my former church, which caused some financial problems. There was talk of legal action for sending unsolicited adult content to little old ladies and other people in the church, but nobody was ever able to prove that Fred did it. I don't think they tried very hard. After all, his wife was in the videos and photos. Both churches really did not want this to become a court case. 
Because of Mr. Charming's trysts and the fact that he had spent years grooming a deacon's wife while he had unlimited, unsupervised access to dozens of church youth would then become a matter of public record, so they hushed it up. I never saw Pastor T again. I had lost all of the trust and respect that I had had for him, and I was sure that he had figured out that I was somehow connected to the whole fiasco. So my chances of having a Baptist preaching career were precisely zero. By that time, being a pastor like Pastor T was the last thing I wanted anyway. I withdrew my application to the Baptist Minister School and eventually completed a doctorate in archaeology at a different grad school, magna cum laude. I've been teaching at a large public university in the Midwest of the USA with summer gigs on archaeological digs in Europe, and I am very happy. One last very gratifying event, the reason for this post. All that happened six to seven years ago. Fast forward to last March. I went to pick up a friend at a large downtown urban bus station in the US. Everyone hates this place. Not only is it crowded, it is poorly maintained and filthy. It smells like spoiled garbage mixed with diesel exhaust and seldom cleaned public restrooms. My friend's bus was late. I stopped by the newsstand to get myself a soda and candy bar. Who do you think was restocking the shelves? Mr. Charming. I just sat across from the newsstand and enjoyed my drink and snack. He recognized me, then turned away. I just sat and watched him restocking shelves full of adult mags and junk food. Revenge is a feast that is best enjoyed cold. As great as this revenge is, Mr. Charming really did this to himself. He was the one that was creepy, he was the one that cheated with a married woman. And he tried to run away from that, but he didn't obviously go far enough. And his past, surprise surprise, still loomed over him and, well, he can't escape that. Do you think Mr. Charming ending up as a shelf stalker at some run-down, terribly smelling, bad town bus station is the appropriate ending for him, or do you think it should have been worse? Should have been better? Let me know in the comments down below. Fire us or cut our pay? Enjoy a mass walkout. Back in the early 2000s, I worked for a tech company who offered tech support, on-site support, and training to organizations who either didn't want specialized IT staff or could benefit from outsourcing. The company consisted of the three directors, a sales department, finance slash HR department, and tech department. Tech was further split with a senior manager, four team members, and each team having two section managers. For call center support, where I worked, we had two team leaders, two senior engineers, two normal engineers, and two juniors. I was a standard engineer, earning 22 k for a job that was worth at least 5 k more outside of the low price area we all lived in. 2006, and I'm still stuck in this job on the same pay. Conditions are worse than before, with no overtime, no flexit time, no financial compensation for industry qualifications, shortened breaks, and no pay rise since I started. To make matters worse, they sold part of the land that the office was on to a developer, and on-site car parking was now for management only. We had to either pay to use the nearby council car park or risk parking on the street. Morale was low, but despite bad pay, it was still good for the area we lived in. One Friday in July, I think it was the 21st, one of the senior engineers finds a document that he shares around the private chat app. It's a restructuring plan that the board voted in last week. Apparently, this had to be made available for the company for three months before any changes to terms and conditions could be made, so the board gave it a generic file name and tried to bury it in the large staff shared area of the network. One of the directors was selling his shares and moving on, having been headhunted by a large recruitment firm in a nearby city. The two remaining directors had managed to buy most of her shares with a small quantity going outside the company. This was the company response. Most of the document was a typical downsize slash restructure package with a twist. A few team mergers, staff reductions, and pay cuts spun as if to say they needed to maximize their profits to put the lost money back into the company. In October, a new contract would be released for all to sign and was generic. In November, the restructure would be announced, and by January 1st, the new structure would be in place. The directors noted that the new contract needed to include clauses for non-competition and for soliciting customers, as these didn't exist except for the sales staff. 
It also mapped current positions to their new ones and what the new salary would be. I would be down by £5,000 a year, but the twist was that anyone with the word manager in their title would have their pay increased drastically. The team manager's pay jumped from 52 k to 65 k for example. By the end of the day, everyone under the rank of team leader had seen this document and was not happy. Over the weekend, I got a text message from one of the senior engineers inviting me to a barbecue at his house. When I got there, most of the tech staff was there, and during the afternoon, we formulated a battle plan. Our revenge. Monday, 24th of July, 8 a.m. 26 people in the tech team arrived for work as normal, each with a letter for the senior manager giving their one-month notice, and all quoting the clause in their contract that states that members of the technical team with access to confidential company information must be offsite and on gardening leave the same day as they hand in their notice. No exceptions will be given. Gardening leave is a term used to say that we still work for the company, have handed in our notice to quit, but can't remain on site or using company resources, so must wait out the remainder of the notice at home. We can't start a new job within that period. The net effect was that at 9.30 a.m., the director realized that his entire tech staff had quit and marched to the office floor and started harassing one of the seniors. The senior simply stood, took off his ID badge and swipe card, handed it to the director and told him, I've already quit, this is me now sticking to my contract. On cue, most of the staff followed, with one member staying until lunchtime. From what I've been told, directors, senior managers, anyone they could get a hold of were on the phones attempting to fix issues. The unsolved open queue went from around 35 to nearly 100 by lunchtime, and naturally the blame was left firmly at the door of those who quit. We were even bad-mouthed to customers. The day after our notice period expired, the senior engineer welcomed 25 new staff to his new company and had already taken 10 large contracts from the place we used to work for. We all had better pay, not much but it was better than losing pay, and much better conditions with an actual career track rather than the whim of the managers. The old company tried to keep afloat for a year, but were losing money on every contract and couldn't afford to employ skilled or experienced people. They closed down in June of 2007, with the owners having to sell personal assets to pay debts, and the two remaining directors declaring personal bankruptcy too. I left the new company in 2010 as the market had changed and more companies were hiring staff than outsourcing, so contracts were harder to find and I also had some minor medical issues that meant I needed to be near home. New company is still going strong though, having lent more towards web design and development than anything else these days. Yeah, very obviously these directors got money hungry, they started seeing dollar signs and they forgot who does the actual work. You completely screw over the entire workforce. I don't think it would be too much of a surprise when they quit on you like that. If you were in this situation, would you willingly join in and quit the job? Let me know in the comments down below. And our second and final story of the day comes by word roll. College master threatens underage student. Public humiliation ensues. This happened maybe eight or nine years ago. I've since graduated and the target has resigned from their position so I don't have any qualms sharing it. This revenge involves the uptight master of residential college I attended who had a reputation for being a stickler for the rules and their subsequent humiliation. I feel like this story straddles the line between petty and pro. It took a fair bit of foresight and planning and trashed a man's reputation, so I'll leave it here. I tried to put it in petty, but mods wouldn't take it. The Inciting Incident Master Grump got in our crosshairs after one particularly annoying evening of rule stickling. One of the freshers in our dorm, Tommy, was about to have his 18th birthday, the legal drinking age in our country. Tommy was turning 18 on a Monday, and given most of us had late classes on Monday night, we decided to take him out on the Sunday for his birthday. The plan was to have a few drinks on the lawn outside our building, then take a bus into the city and hit up a club at midnight. Now, our college was what is known as a dry college, aka alcohol in the building is a big no-no. You can get pissed on the lawn 10 yards from the front door, you can get slaughtered and come home not knowing where your room is, 
but carrying a can inside will get you cautioned and possibly kicked out. The only exception is if you're handing over alcohol to an RA to safe keep in a locked storeroom. Generally, most of us were fans of the dry rule. It kept parties outside when you had to study for exams, and generally our building was way cleaner and took less damage than the others on campus. But the application of this rule could cause issues. This night, me, another guy from our dorm, and Tommy had just collected a slab we bought earlier from the RA on duty. Just as we were about to leave the building, the other guy says he needs to run upstairs to grab his wallet. And so, I take the opportunity to duck into the downstairs bathroom to take a leak. The blame is on us, but the end result is a technically underage Tommy, standing by himself, with a slab of beer in reception. Oops. Master Grump must have been working late that evening, and while I was in the bathroom, he comes out of reception and starts ripping into Tommy. By the time I'm back there, he's confiscated the alcohol and cautioned Tommy. I tried to explain to him that we had just retrieved the alcohol from the RA on duty and that we were on our way out of the building, but that only got me cautioned for supplying alcohol to a minor. I replied that that was totally unfair and that Tommy would be 18 at midnight and hadn't drunk a thing. Grump just looked at Tommy and said, How old are you, Tommy? I'll be 18 in a few out, and my grandchild will be 18 in 10 years. How old are you, Tommy? After chewing us out for being irresponsible and failing to uphold the community standards of our residential agreement, etc., he replied that he was required to call Tommy's parents as well as the police. Fun. The police took forever to arrive because apparently a 17-year-old planning to go to a party isn't an urgent priority. Who would have thought? And once they arrived, it didn't take long to tell they thought the whole thing was a giant waste of time. They warned me about buying alcohol for people underage, but since Tommy was about to turn 18 in like 90 minutes, they didn't really care. Tommy's parents were bewildered. I got given a curfew for three months. I had to be back in the building by 11 p.m., and so, Tommy's big night out was spent in the master's office, waiting for the police. Woot woot. It was a total stitch up and it really messed with Tommy. He wasn't a rule breaker by any stretch of the imagination, and was on a scholarship with the college that the master threatened they would pull. Master Grump needed to be taken down a peg. But how? The revenge. Once every couple of months, our college had big formal events. Attendance was mandatory and everyone would get dressed up, have a sit-down meal and listen to whatever guest speaker had been arranged for the evening. The quality of the speakers varied. We'd had a mix of different academics, politicians, including a former head of state, artists, etc. But it was always a big deal for the college and master grump. There were always a couple of tables with honored guests and alumni, representatives from the university, and so on. We residents were always put on notice. Any antisocial behavior would be punished swiftly and harshly. People would get cautioned for just failing to attend, let alone causing a scene. None of us particularly wanted to get kicked out of our accommodation, and Tommy certainly didn't want to lose his scholarship, but when it was announced that the education minister would be speaking at the next formal dinner, and that all the brass, including the chancellor, from the university would be in attendance, it felt like an opportunity that shouldn't be missed. This is how the night went down. When Master Grump got up to introduce the education minister, all seemed fine. He began by describing the minister's life, having come from a single parent home and working as an entertainer while studying at Harvard, equivalent. He then described how the minister went on to record a number of educational children's songs, including The Elephant's Big Blue Ball, before completing his PhD. While this was going on, the minister's face was getting more and more uncomfortable, and at the mention of the elephant's blue balls went dark red. But Master Grum just kept going on and on. You see, we had discovered a pattern in the master's introductions at formal dinners. They just happened to read very similar to the Wikipedia article on each one of our guests. We'd noticed this the year prior when a guest corrected the master on the number of years she had spent doing research in Egypt and commented that our college weren't the first to get it wrong. It was even incorrect on Wikipedia. That was the seed of this idea. 
a few corrections to the education minister's Wikipedia profile over the previous four weeks proved to be very fruitful on our end, with the result of Master Grump making an absolute idiot of himself. We started small, changing the school the minister went to, adding in a degree he never attained. But before long, we had Master Grump calling a sitting minister a former clown who sung kid songs about blue balls in front of the chancellor, the college board, a host of alumni, and the minister himself. It was glorious. The minister handled it like a pro. Up the front, he just corrected the school he attended and made a comment that he has a terrible singing voice. But watching the high table later, we observed a satisfying interaction in which Master Grump looked as white as a sheet and appeared to be apologizing profusely to the minister and his wife. The beautiful thing is that education is the field that our master researches and publishes in. Whether there were consequences beyond the public and professional humiliation, we will never know. From the look on the Chancellor's face, I suspect Grump's performance review went swimmingly. Afterwards, we went out and celebrated with a slab of beer. It's absolutely zero fun to have an absolute stickler for the rules. The breakdown is simple. You went to use the bathroom, you're not going to take a slab of beer with you into the bathroom, so you let your friend hold it who's 17, in 90 minutes they're going to be 18 years old and be legal to drink it anyways, they're not drinking it then. I mean, yes, I guess it's possession, but obviously the police didn't even care. Master Grump was such a stickler in situations where he really didn't have to be, and frankly the majority of anyone else wouldn't be. The police didn't do anything, so it's fitting that they went absolutely humiliated them and then enjoyed with a slab of beer, bringing it all the way back around. I destroyed a brewery. Nearly 20 years ago, I was a brewer at a brew pub. The owner was a complete lunatic and an utter a-hole. Before I was hired, he had already purchased the brewery equipment used from a closed microbrewery. Problem is, it was literally four times larger than it needed to be for the size of the place, and to top it off, he was selling big three beers too. And it was a Pugsley system. Brewers will know. But I made it work, even got the stupid ringwalled yeast to behave. But I only need to brew about three or four times a month. I have worked at places we brewed that much a week. So I wasn't needed anywhere near 40 hours a week. And I was salaried. So he decided I needed to work night manager at least two nights a week to fill out my hours. That was fine, it was an easy gig. After our first year, he advertised a huge anniversary event with specials on food and drink, food specials, commercial beer specials, and didn't even mention that we made our own, much less put anything on special, idiot. Not too long after, I got my first vacation in over a year and he was mad at me for insisting. But life was stressful, not least of which was because my mom was in hospice, stage 4 cancer. But her condition was such that she said my wife and I should go. She'll be fine. So we went camping for a week. The day before our trip was to end, we got word she had died. Two days earlier. My family didn't know how to reach us, only she did. We rushed home, 6 hour drive, and on the way, I called my boss and told him what had happened, and that I probably would not be in on Monday as planned. This was Saturday. I found out later from a bartender that he then witched at the chef that I was probably going to want more time off. I did in fact take Monday off, but I went in on Tuesday to do my night manager shift. Now, my mom's wishes were to be cremated with no embalming, so by the time I got home, she was already cremated. So the memorial service was planned for two weeks later, right before Labor Day weekend. There was to be a memorial service Thursday and the interment for the family Friday. So I planned and made sure that the servers were full and I wouldn't need to brew for at least a week. That Wednesday, the boss comes and tells me he wants me to work night shift on Thursday and Friday. Normally, I did Tuesday and Wednesday nights to make up for the time off I'd taken to help my dad out. He wasn't handling it well. He wanted me to come in after my mom's funeral. I flatly refused, at which point he said fine, but I'd have to work a double shift Saturday then. I nearly lost it. 
I walked away, and after I cooled off, I went back and told them I was no longer going to do the manager shifts, and that I wanted to switch to hourly for brewery work only. He was angry, but stuck. He needed me in the brewery. Things started calming down, but after a few weeks, I noticed my paychecks were for less than I anticipated. I hadn't been tracking my clock in clock out very closely because prior to this I only clocked in and out so I was logged in to do manager functions, but I happened to have a couple slips in my wallet and because I still had manager access, discovered he had been altering my hours, eventually cheating me out of around 20 hours in just 6 weeks. And that's when I hatched my plan. I was done with this a-hole. Remember that ringwood yeast? Well, in a brewery, you harvest yeast from a fermenting batch to use to brew a later one. And since we were slow, it often had to be stored for a while before it got used. But you had to use it within 30 days. 21 is better, or it starts going sour and starts drying. Normally, I would take other steps to ensure it stayed clean and healthy, but not on the last batch I harvested. It just went into the cold room and stayed there. I stopped going in very often. Just logging tank levels to make sure nothing ran out and made him suspicious. I would even go in to make sure he wasn't in that day and later message him that I'd brewed. I hadn't. And waited. On day 45, after I got the check for the last hours I worked, I overnighted my keys in with a resignation letter. He called me the next day screaming. I told him I knew what he'd done and I wouldn't be back. I don't know what he looked like when he went into the brewery cellar and discovered he had empty fermenters, nearly empty serving tanks, dead yeast, and almost no grain. Pity really. After that, he tried to hire my former assistant, who was working at another brew pub by then because the a-hole had forced me to fire him to save money. He laughed at him. He then apparently got the underage son of one of the brewers at a nearby brew pub, which he had originally been part of to brew for him but had to fire him because the kid kept getting caught drunk down in the cellar. So he tried doing it, and I had heard they stopped brewing entirely eventually. About a year after I left, he folded. Staff showed up one morning to padlocked doors. Drove through there a few years back. Not only gone, but the building was torn down. I felt like stopping to sow the ground with salt, but I was in a hurry. So OP was facing probably one of the most tragic experiences of their life, and the owner could only complain and try to get the hours back out of the guy? There's no compassion, there's no care for the people who work there. They just see workers that have to fill hours out. So let me ask you this, do you think OP went too far by basically destroying their stock and leaving the owner with nothing to recoup, and by extension basically ruining the business? Let me know yes or no in the comments down below. Our next story is by Squirrelboy315, treat one employee bad, lose many. This past March 14th marked my wife and I's 5th anniversary, which we had planned a nice romantic trip only about 1.5 hours from our home. The Airbnb we were going to stay at was right on a river, in the middle of virtually nowhere, spotty cell signal, no internet connection, full on removed from society. As the date approached, COVID started to take off here in the states, with tons of uncertainty and confusion about what was going to happen. Wife and I discussed cancelling the trip maybe, but agreed we'd be so far removed from anyone and everything that we'd follow through. March 14th was a Saturday and we planned on being at the Airbnb that night, drop our daughter off with my father-in-law early in the morning the day of, and he arranged to take off work until we picked her up on Wednesday and I would be back to work on Thursday. As an IT department of one, I knew I was going to be called. Hadn't taken a single uninterrupted vacation in five years. So I was glad the cell signal was iffy at best at this place. I also know if I could minimize my PTO to only three days, the company wouldn't suffer, especially if things got catastrophic. Lastly, the Airbnb was one and a half hours from my house, but about 45 minutes from the office. In a worst case scenario, I could be there in under an hour, assuming they could get through to me, which turned out to be highly plausible. Cell signal wasn't great, but the 2G was available. Now for the fun to really start. The day before our trip, the CEO calls me in his office. 
OP, I know you have a trip planned to celebrate your anniversary, but COVID is taking off and we can't be without you for one day, let alone three, and although it's approved, we need you to reschedule your anniversary. March 14th is my anniversary. I can't slash won't reschedule my anniversary. My wife took off work, my father-in-law took off work, Airbnb wasn't offering refunds yet, my mother-in-law took off work, there are a lot of moving cogs here, and if I said I'd cancel, then I'd inconvenience so many people. I said I'd consider it and texted my wife and told her. She told me I have no choice, we rely heavily on my income, and we can't function without it. Go to our HR department and explain the situation and ask his opinion. Of course, he has to stand between the company's stance and his personal stance, never to incriminate anyone but told him, heck no, I'm not cancelling. HR calls in CEO after I left, then HR calls me, tons of back and forth until the end of the day. CEO says, Look OP, I know where you stand, your anniversary is important, but it's selfish if you think for one second about going on this vacation. It's careless and self-centered, you're going to let everyone else suffer so you can celebrate. It's my anniversary. I'll be gone for three work days, less than an hour away and my phone will be turned on. He started getting red and enraged. No, that's the problem. I can't be running around looking for my IT guy in these unpredicted times. I can't be wasting my time trying to find you and hoping you'll pick up your phone. I haven't taken a single uninterrupted vacation in five years. Have I proven once I'm unreachable? We are going to pay for all incidentals and inconveniences. The company is willing to pay all associated debts, do you understand? Do you have any idea how much your skills mean to this company? We've never done this for anyone. And I never agreed to being on call, but I constantly interrupt every vacation to help where it's needed. I'm not interested in canceling my vacation. No, it is selfish of you if you decide to take this trip. You prove you don't care about anyone here and only yourself, so you will be here on Monday or else. Do you understand? Yes. Good. Texted the guys I worked closest with the following night. A picture of my wife and I standing on the side of a river saying, It was nice working with y'all, but I'm not doing ultimatums. Why for work? I choose the one I'm married to. They said it would never happen. No way the CEO would fire their only IT guy who was supporting their staff of 70 plus people. They were wrong. The guys I worked closest with were told they were now IT managers and that I was done to take ownership of all my accounts, lock me out, blah blah blah. My phone began to blow up after that with texts and phone calls from the dudes I worked with and an outsourced IT firm who was available when I was away. Why was this happening? What were they going to do? What did I do? The full true story, blah 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 and told them all. I was told to choose between my wife or my work and because of COVID, I had to cancel. Wednesday was worse. The CEO calls a company-wide meeting and informs everyone if they needed IT help, contact these other guys, don't contact me anymore. This led to even more phone calls, more texts just exploding all day while I laugh outside, but internally nervous AF knowing unemployment isn't going to be enough. Thursday, I roll in, laptop in hand, backpack empty, go into the CEO's office. He said, You know what's going to happen. Put the laptop down. HR will escort you to your desk. Get your stuff. Have a good day. You have 15 minutes. That Friday, they laid off 40 to 50 people, and my phone has been blowing up ever since. After being there for 7 years, the remaining folks have been calling me, texting me and messaging me to give updates on the state of the company. Four of the remaining licensed and valuable employees have quit, citing their treatment of me as a catalyst for them to get the freak out. Being fired for going on a 3 day vacation scared all of them. If a loyal employee with zero disciplinary infractions gets fired for valuing their privacy, what's going to keep them all around? Since then, my former employer attempted to block my unemployment. After 30 days, the state overruled and awarded me back pay. The state offered additional funds for unemployment relief. Stimulus package was nice. Daycare closed. 
and now I'm currently a stay-at-home father, making the same amount of money on unemployment as I was while employed, and we aren't paying for daycare right now. Finally, after almost six months of being unemployed, I was offered a job making my former salary plus my wife's salary, and she's going to become a stay-at-home mom when I start. We've been financially stable and completely unaffected by everything. Can't say the same for my old job. Apparently, they can't hire people willing to work there, and they are about to have no one left with licenses to sign off on anything. It takes some big guts to accept losing your job over something like that, but if you work there for half a decade and could never have a single vacation where you could just relax, I'd be a bit over it too. They needed to cut you a little bit of slack. Yes, the situation was bad and it's getting worse for everybody, but you're a loyal employee that worked there for five years and has never taken a actual proper vacation. Let them have your three days, it'll be fine. And our final story of the day is by Tremendo the Great. Friend Crink called me at my job, so I had him served with a fake paternity suit at his. Ten years ago, a friend of mine Crink called me several times in my office over the course of a day. I decided in that moment that one, this would not stand, and two, rather than entering into a long, protracted quagmire of a prank war, I would use the nuclear option and end it immediately. My friend, Mike, was a well-known local bartender. I worked at the same bar as a bouncer, and he was very much enjoying single life at the time, facts which I knew I could take advantage of. Soon, a plan began to form. I would have him served with a fake paternity suit while he was working at the bar. So, I compiled a ton of free online legal documents, not just for the paternity suit, but also income disclosure forms, statements of parental rights and suggested visitation schedules pending demonstrable proof of sobriety. I filled out all the forms, then smeared what looked like date-received stamps as proof they had been filed and ran copies to make those stamps even more illegible. From there, I crafted a backstory to be included in a cover letter from the fictional mother's fake law firm, the nearby city family law center, on a letterhead and all. The mother was an Irish exchange student visiting the area the previous summer. She had only been with Mike so she knew the baby, Eliza, was his. The cover letter encouraged Mike to call during regular office hours to discuss arranging a DNA test to affirm paternity. I set up a generic voicemail for the number listed as the office on the letterhead. By the end, the paperwork was somewhere between 20 to 25 pages. I enlisted another friend, not known by Mike, to serve the documents and instructed him to do so around 10 p.m. on a Saturday evening. I told him to keep the interaction very simple. I wasn't able to be by the back bar because I knew I would be laughing too hard, but based on eyewitness reports, it played out like this. Are you Mike last name? Yes. Michael middle last name? Yes. Friend drops folder on the bar. What's that? Paternity suit. You've been served. Turns around and immediately walks out of the bar. Yeah, that sounds about right. Mike read through the packet, shakily poured himself several drinks, and then ran over to the bar owner, who was aware of the prank, to ask what to do. He also called the number on the letterhead, but sadly did not leave a voicemail. After a solid 10 minutes of intense psychological revenge, the owner finally told Mike he should closely read the last page of the packet. On it, in size 2 font, it read, Go freak yourself, Mike. At which point, Mike ran to the front door and punched me in the chest. Epilogue. Several months later, Mike was on a trip across the country. He had left his car at home with his mom, who generously had it washed for him. Mike, for some reason, kept the paternity suit paperwork in his driver's side door. During the course of the car wash, his mother found it and read the entire thing, then called him sobbing in the middle of the night asking why he hadn't told her about her secret Irish granddaughter. The best pranks are the ones that bubble back up after a while and hit a second wave. I don't know why he would keep that seemingly incriminating paperwork around, but oof, that would be a terrible call to get in the middle of the night and have to talk down. No, no, it's fake. A friend tried to prank me, I swear. And then having to explain that they have to look at the last page to see the go freak yourself, Mike. The long game. This is a long story, so settle back and relax. I love this up. 
and I have taken to asking friends about great revenge stories. This one comes from my boss, who lives in the small town where it occurred. To set the stage, many decades ago, Barney and Betty immigrated from Europe and bought a farm. A few years later they had kids and sponsored Wilma from the old country as a nanny. She met Fred, a local boy, fell in love and got married. Wilma stayed on as the nanny and Fred worked as a farmhand. Their kids and Barney and Betty's kids grew up together and it was pretty much a big blended family. Years go by and Barney and Betty decide to sell the farm fields to farmer Frank but kept the land the house was on. They made enough off the sale to build a nice new house and rezone the property lines. They broke the lot up into two parcels, one for the new house and one for the existing house, which they gifted to Fred and Wilma as a recognition of their years of dedicated and loving service. Both houses shared a well and a septic field. More time went by. Barney and Betty passed away and their house was inherited by their son, Bam Bam. Fred also passed away and Wilma stayed in the house. She was an angel. Everyone in the town knew and loved her. She was like the town's grandmother. She was active in the church and liked nothing more than crocheting booties for anyone in town that had a baby. Sadly, Wilma passed away too and her house was inherited by her daughter, Pebbles. She was well established in a nearby metropolitan city and made the decision to sell the house. And so it begins. To give you a better idea of the setup, here is a rough diagram. The parcel for sale is the yellow bit which backs onto protected park land and is bordered by Bam Bam's land and Farmer Frank's fields. It was purchased by a builder from the city which we'll call Richard. The name suits him. He wanted it as a country getaway as he already had a place in the city. He got approval to improve the place and his plans were to convert the barn into a multi-car garage with a man cave and an apartment in what was the loft. He started by tearing down the house with plans to replace it with a bigger, more modern house. The house was torn down and the new build was started. The lower part of the yellow represents a very narrow driveway. Between that driveway and Farmer Frank's field was a drainage culvert. So the contractor started parking their vehicles on Bam Bam's lot. Bam Bam asked the contractors not to do it, but they didn't stop, so he approached Richard and the conversation didn't go well. Richard was an entitled big shot, dealing with what he thought was a country bumpkin. To give you an idea, Richard once went to the local diner and asked for the wine list. He was aggressive and disrespectful and this pretty much set the tone for all future interactions. Bam Bam had enough. These contractor trucks were tearing up his ground, so one weekend, he built a fence along the border between his house and Richard's. It wasn't a complicated fence, he just got a buddy with a post hole digger on his bobcat, sunk posts and strung planks between them. This caused no end of trouble with the build. There was no room to park in the yellow for the contractors without getting in each other's way, and they couldn't park in the driveway, which was only wide enough for one vehicle at a time. Contractors were pissed off, they had a long walk from the road to the build site, and had to carry tools and equipment back and forth. Either that, or take turns dropping materials, waiting hours for the carpenters to finish unloading the lumber so that the plumbers could unload the pipes. Richard was furious and came stomping over to Bam Bam demanding that he dismantle the fence. Bam Bam told him to go to heck. Then a day later, Bam Bam saw that someone had removed some of the fence and the contractor trucks were back on his land. Okay, thought Bam Bam, let's play. The following weekend, Bam Bam irrigated the area where the contractors were parking. Irrigated it long and continuously. He probably had to get a water delivery to make it happen, as the well had a limited capacity. On Monday, the first contractor to arrive turned off Richard's driveway to go through the fence and immediately sank up to his axles in mud. Did I mention that Bam Bam owned the local service station and knew every tow truck company within 100 miles? As it turned out, everyone they called was too busy to pull the truck out and they had to call a tow truck from the city almost two hours away. You can see how the relationship between Bam Bam and Richard became somewhat less than neighborly. 
time went by and Richard's house was completed. It was a low maintenance setup with interlocking brick over the compound, tall hedges separating Richard from Bam Bam. They kept out of each other's way, but they certainly weren't pals. Richard's kids would come up on the weekend and have a party now and then, but Bam Bam put up with it. One issue that arose was when Richard decided to fill the small swimming pool that he had installed. This drew the well dry and caused some sand to be pulled into the water treatment equipment. When Bam Bam approached Richard about the cost of the repair, via email, Richard basically replied that it was Bam Bam's problem. The same when the septic holding tank needed to be pumped. Bam Bam offered to split the cost of the pumping and Richard refused to part with a dime. Years passed and Richard decided to list the house for sale. That's when Bam Bam made his move. He cut the water and capped the septic line leading from Richard's house. Then he informed the real estate agent of what he had done. Well, that induced a thunderstorm for sure. There's no way Richard could sell a house that had no water or any way to dispose of waste. He couldn't build a septic field on his property, it was too small. He approached Farmer Frank to buy some of his land, but was rebuffed. His only option would have been to install a septic holding tank, but the only place to put it would have been right in the middle of his compound. And septic tanks can be… aromatic. It would also have meant removing the in-ground pool. Richard tried to argue in court that he was entitled to access to the well water and the septic field, but Bam Bam won, arguing that the Wilma and Fred were given water and septic as a courtesy, and that there was no contractual obligation to provide Richard either well water or septic access. There was nothing in the deed to Wilma and Fred that could be grandfathered in, and Richard's emails refusing to pay for maintenance to either system was the nail in the coffin. The property sat vacant and unusable for months. The price dropped through the floor, and the few people that expressed an interest in the property approached Bam Bam with varying offers of cash to restore service. Bam Bam declined. No offers were made to Richard for the house. Finally, Richard did receive an offer from a numbered corporation, an offer that was about a quarter of the asking price. As is, with a statement that the buyer was aware that there was no water or septic service to the property. Without much choice, Richard accepted the offer. And that's how Bam Bam bought himself a beautiful modern country home at a steal of a price. He reattached the water and septic in an afternoon and moved his furniture down the driveway and had the numbered company negotiate with himself for an arrangement for perpetual use of the well and septic, thereby jacking the value of the house by a factor of four. Later, if he decides to sell it, he'll be making a massive profit. Bam Bam now enjoys a country paradise and is the social king of the hill in his town, all because Richard decided to be a Richard. Obviously, you know what Richard is long for, so if you didn't catch on to that right away, you can go ahead and fill that back in. So, a question for you is, do you think Bam Bam was being unreasonable when they tried to constantly se- so, my question to you is, do you think Bam Bam was justified when he was blocking off access to his land, whether it be the fence or the irrigation? If so, why? Let me know in the comments down below. And our final story of the day is written by the male Mary Poppins, Break my phone? You'll pay for the damage. I was always the kid people picked on at school. The girls would spread rumors about me and the boys would harass me nonstop. See, I'd always known that I wanted to be a nanny. I loved babysitting and looking after kids, so it seemed like a natural career choice for me. I made the mistake of telling this to a girl who I thought was my friend, and she proceeded to tell everyone at school. As this was perceived as feminine, I instantly became the target for bullies. There was one boy who loved to terrorize me. I'll call him Jack for the sake of the story. Jack was awful, he would follow me home whilst throwing things at me, vandalize my schoolwork, call me disgusting names, steal my stuff, cut my hair in class, etc. I was terrified of him. It got to the point where I couldn't sleep from the fear of having to deal with him at school the next day. I blame him and his friends for the anxiety I had, 
and still somewhat have to this day. I reached breaking point not long after Christmas when I was 15. My family never had a lot of money, but we got by. My mom had saved for ages in order to buy me my first phone. No, it wasn't the newest model, but I didn't care. I was so grateful to have my first phone, and a little guilty that my mom had gone without her new Christmas outfit and had put off fixing her own phone to buy it for me. Once the schools went back after Christmas break, Jack found out about my phone. He took it from me and proceeded to read through my messages, making fun of me for the lack of contacts and telling my mom I loved her, then threw it to the floor and stomped on it in front of his friends. I was furious, upset, and devastated this tick had destroyed something that my mom had worked so hard to buy for me. I started planning my revenge. I knew through the grapevine that Jack's mom was a stay-at-home mom. His dad had a well-paid job and his mother was quite happy to stay at home with the kids. Four-year-old twin girls. I also knew, however, that she didn't get to go out much as Jack would flat out refuse to babysit and she was pretty picky when it came to who was allowed to look after her kids. I used to babysit her friend's little boy and was pretty good at it, if I do say so myself. However, for my plan to work, I had to babysit Jack's siblings. I made a few comments here and there to the little boy's mom about wanting to get a few more babysitting jobs so I could save up some money for my mom's upcoming birthday. As luck would have it, the lady recommended me to Jack's mom since it had been so long since she'd been able to go out with the girls. For the next few weeks, I'd go to Jack's house with the other little boy I was babysitting and look after his little sisters. Despite Jack's awful attitude, his family were all pretty nice. His little sisters were an absolute joy to look after. Jack wasn't usually in the house, but when he was, I could see that it killed him to have to be civil to me. His mom would have flipped out if he had been horrible to me in front of her or his little sisters. They'd have quickly ratted him out. Once I decided enough time had passed, I put my plan into action. See, Jack was one of those creepy kids that liked to brag about his adult magazine stash in his bedroom. This made him cool to his friends. Never understood why, to be honest. Anyways, every time I'd babysit and put the little ones to bed, I'd sneak into his bedroom and search around. I know this is a massive invasion of privacy, but I was a stupid 15-year-old kid and I couldn't take his bullying anymore. I eventually found his stash and made a mental note that they were in a bag in his closet. I'd been observant those few weeks, so I knew that Jack's mom and dad had an unopened bottle of vodka in the fridge. They didn't drink a lot and it was only for when they were going to parties. One night, once the little ones were asleep and Jack was out with his friends, I went to the fridge, opened the bottle of alcohol and tipped about a quarter of it down the sink. His parents could afford to buy a new one by the way, if they couldn't I'd have never have done it. And snuck up to Jack's bedroom and hid the bottle in the same bag as his stash. His parents found out about it not too long after and after Jack accused me of taking it, they showed up at my door. They weren't angry because they still don't know who had taken it, so they asked me some questions. I denied everything, but was polite and even offered to help them look for it in case it had been misplaced. They thanked me, but told me that it was fine, they'd find it. And oh boy, did they find it. I was called over the next day to take the little ones to the park for an hour or so, in order for them to have a talk with Jack. They didn't like arguing in front of the twins. It frightened them. When I got back, Jack was in his bedroom. If the noises were anything to go by, he was crying. It turns out that he'd ratted himself out. His parents found the bottle of alcohol in his room along with his adult magazines. His mother hated anything like that as she found it degrading to women. She humiliated him by gossiping to the neighbors about his unhealthy obsession with sex. He'd denied everything and accused me of planting the alcohol there. When asked why I'd do that, he ratted himself out by saying that it was payback for him breaking my phone. His parents flipped out. They'd had no idea their son was such a bully. They took away his phone, grounded him, and made him sell his game console to pay to get my phone fixed. I had been saving up the money myself for a few weeks. 
His face when they made him hand me the money will stay with me forever. His parents questioned me about the bullying, eventually informing my mom as well. I'd hidden it from her and told her I dropped my phone. He got into a lot of crap at school after a few other kids came forward about the bullying they'd endured at the hands of Jack and his friends. A few of them, including Jack, got suspended. Jack's parents even made him go to the door to apologize to the people he'd tormented. I was reluctant to take the money at first as it was way over the amount it would cost to get my phone fixed, so his parents compromised and told me to take enough to at least cover the repair cost. Needless to say, with the phone repair covered, I managed to get my mom an awesome birthday gift. So I'm not going to say that planting the alcohol and tipping it out was the right thing to do, but I also think he's plenty justified for doing it. Does that make any sense? I'm glad that after having to put up with all this tormentation and bullying and just such incredibly bad and negative experiences, they were able to get their phone fixed and get their mom something that they deserved because it sounds like their mom was a great mom. D-Bag Neighbor decides the proper place for his glass Starbucks bottle is in a million shards in front of my driveway. I had some real D-bag neighbors renting the house next door a couple years ago whom I had to bang on their door in the early AM hours on 4 or 5 occasions to get them to turn off their music slash bass that was rattling my windows and waking up my 9 month pregnant wife who I'm pretty sure would have beaten the guy's head in if I let her go over there. The last time it happened was 3 a.m. the night we got back from the hospital with our four-day-old daughter and my sleep-deprived self had some choice words. They also had a Harley and a diesel F-250, I think, with like a 5-inch lift and loud butt engine and exhaust that the guy loved to rev up in the driveway and then just do laps around the neighborhood for an hour or so also knocked over my mailbox once and my other neighbor's mailbox twice, as well as putting a huge butt rut in the neighbor's yard when he drove into it after a storm. So when my fellow grudge-bearing neighbor and I saw the small ticked freak stick toss a glass Starbucks bottle out of his window one morning as he was pulling out of his driveway, and we saw it hit the street and shatter and him just drive away, Keep in mind my neighbor and I were about 10 feet in front of him so he definitely saw us standing there talking and then yelling at him as he drove off. We went over there that night and took his overflowing trash can off the curb, pulled out all the trash bags, cut them open and filled his truck bed with all that garbage. He left one of the back windows cracked about 2 inches so we shoved banana peels and coffee grounds and other trash through the window into the cab. I went back to the house and grabbed a couple cans of tuna and we smeared it into as many nooks and crannies as we could on his Harley and dumped the fish juice into his helmet which he was kind enough to leave out. Cops were there the next morning and I got to start my day hearing this white trash a-hole screaming at the cops for 30 minutes. Then they got evicted about a month later. So to be completely honest. The neighbors sound terrible, I wouldn't want to live next to these people, but I think there was much more constructive ways of handling this than completely destroying property that they owned. Yes, they did a lot of noise complaint type stuff. Yes, they did litter and smash a glass bottle on the road. Does that mean you should go and trash his Harley and his F-250? I don't think that's justifiable at all. What do you guys think? Let me know. Our next post comes from Restless Witch Face. I fed the witch dog treats. Buckle up kiddos, this is a long and exciting ride. The year was 2006. I was a young dumb girl that had gone and gotten myself married to someone completely wrong for me. He refused to work and as a result of financial difficulties of us both being in school and only me working, we found us living with his mom. Let me tell you, that is every newlywed's dream. Over the course of us living with her, anytime I would buy myself a food treat, mother-in-law would eat it. Didn't matter what it was or where I hid it, she was a bloodhound for sniffing out things that I bought just for me. The final straw was one night we had gone out to dinner at the Cheesecake Factory. I had taken my slice to go and put it in the fridge. I was going to have it after work the next day. Next day at work is absolute shoot and the only thing getting me through my shift is the slice of cheesecake I know is in my fridge. 
I go home and pop the lid off the container and it doesn't look right. There are mother freaking fork marks all around the outside perimeter of my cheesecake. Why she could just sneak some off all around and I wouldn't notice. I was pissed. I went and handed it to her and told her she may as well eat the rest of it. Fast forward a few days and I am at the pet store picking up some dog food. I'm standing in line waiting to check out and they have these little boxes of dog treats that look like the little red boxes of animal crackers you can buy for little kids. Now it very clearly says on the front, circus animals for dogs. About this time I've got the little devil sitting on my shoulder whispering in my ear, do it. And then the angel pops onto my other shoulder and screams, freaking do it. So they magically end up with the stuff I am buying. I drive home and leave everything in a bag all together on the kitchen counter. Several hours later, she comes into our room and says, I think there was something wrong with those animal crackers. They were the most awful ones I've ever eaten. I had to eat a whole thing of frosting with them just to finish them. All I said was, huh, and shrugged my shoulders. Listen, I would have tried the exact same thing if this mother-in-law was eating my food. If there's one thing I can always fall on, it's that I love eating, I love food. So if I was getting all these treats and every single time it was spoiled because this mother-in-law was eating them, I think you let her off easy with little animal crackers for dogs. And if she keeps doing it, you should graduate to full-on wet canned food or something. Call it some gourmet beef dish that you saved in some Tupperware. Our next story comes from your mom, 1977. Cheating ex, his side chick, and other shenanigans. I caught my BF of over a year with another woman, who was a friend of mine. I had introduced her to him, and I ended it but had to see both of them regularly since we all worked together. Three months later, he quit out of the blue, no two weeks notice, nothing. Because he got another woman pregnant in another state and she was about to give birth. He had worked for the employer for 10 plus years. My ex-friend tried to come cry to me about how he had hurt her too. I guess she assumed that I wouldn't embarrass her in public? She was wrong. I chewed her butt out in front of everyone in the break room and told her she got what she deserved. Oh, and the guy? The kid wasn't his. He quit his cushy job for nothing and had left such a bad taste in the supervisor's mouth from the other a-hole things that he had done that when he tried to get his job back, the boss told him, don't call us, we'll call you. I didn't technically do shoot, but god, after roughly the one year of heck with him and the year of chaos afterwards, really slept a lot better at night. Unfortunately for OP, this situation had a number of red flags. Red flags not only just for OP, let me clarify. Usually, it's not a good idea to involve yourself with somebody that you work with, which all three of them work together, which... That was a nightmare waiting to happen right there. Secondly, a cheater is most likely going to cheat again. So your ex-friend goes and sleeps with your boyfriend, and then she assumes he's going to be loyal? I feel like she should have been aware that it was a very real situation that could have happened. And, well, did. And our next story is written by Lily Go Pee Kid on the school bus gets more than he bargained for when he steals my brother's snacks. This preteen imbecile, without asking, would snatch my brother's backpack from the seat behind us and root through it for food. He would then proceed to loudly complain to anyone listening if there was nothing edible or if he didn't like what he had stolen. We repeatedly told him to stop, but this continued to occur over a span of several months. So, as anyone would do in the situation, so as anyone would do in the situation, we decided to fill a bag of very enticing looking corn nuts with dog kibble and wasabi balls. For those of you who don't know, wasabi balls are the same size and weight of corn nuts and you can't taste the spice until they've been in your mouth for about 3 seconds. The kibble was also the same size slash weight as the corn nuts. As per our previous observations, we learned that the kid would tear these bags open and pour about a quarter of the bag's contents into his mouth at once, so we planned accordingly. We made a small incision at the very bottom of the bag took out about half of the corn nuts and replaced them with the wasabi balls and kibble. 
We then used invisible tape over the incision to make sure the thief wouldn't suspect anything and shook the bag to mix the contents. In my opinion, it was great handiwork for two 12-year-olds barely passing math. The next morning, we were more than ready to enact revenge. Our plan worked seamlessly. When the kid took the backpack and stole the bag of corn nuts, we discreetly watched from the other side of the seat. He didn't think to look around while tearing open his prize. As hypothesized, he poured about a quarter of the corn nuts into his mouth. He chewed for about five seconds before he spewed the kibble, wasabi ball, and corn nut mixture all over the floor of the bus. He didn't even look at us, which was probably a good thing, seeing as we were trying our hardest not to burst out laughing. Needless to say, he did not steal my brother's snacks after that incident, and he got in trouble for making a mess of the bus. I have many, many more stories about this dude throughout the rest of middle school and into high school, but this is by far my favorite. Man, oh man, I'm just thinking about all the fun concoctions you can come up with to fool this kid into eating it. Any suggestions? Kibble and wasabi balls though, that's a definite good combination. And the small incision at the bottom of the bag and careful packaging, I would say that definitely was pretty good handiwork for two 12 year old kids. My condolences though to the other half of the corn nuts because you did have to sacrifice that bag still. And on to the next story by Seraphim676. The revenge that got me into Pokemon. I was sitting and chatting with my grandfather about my childhood today and he told me about a simple story of petty comeuppance he got years ago. I was a young boy, perhaps three years old. At the time, my parents owned a two-family house and were renting the upstairs apartment to another family who had a kid that was around my age, maybe a year older. As this was back in the mid-90s, the original Pokemon craze was in full swing. Yet somehow, the craze hadn't made its way to me yet. The boy upstairs had been collecting the trading cards and had decided to show off his collection to me. I don't remember what cards he had specifically, but for some reason I vaguely remember being shown an Arbok card. Immediately, I was intrigued. At some point, I must have mentioned the cards to my grandparents. My grandfather told me that he was out shopping with my grandmother one day and she pointed out the Pokemon cards to him while they were in the store, mentioning that those were the cards I was interested in. He decided to buy a couple of packs to bring a smile to my face. After I reveled in my new cards, I decided to go show them to the boy upstairs to show him what I got. As kids are wanting to do, he decided to brag to me that he has way more cards. My grandfather's first thought upon hearing that? We'll see about that. My grandparents were not rich people. My grandmother worked for most of her life, and my grandfather worked two jobs until the day he retired. He usually used the money from his main job to pay the bills, and the second job is expendable income. He decided from that point on that he was going to throw that second income at buying up Pokemon cards for me. He started slow at first, buying card packs at a time for a while, then eventually he started going all out. He would buy boxes filled with Pokemon cards. He befriended the hobby shop owners to figure out where to get the specific cards I was missing. He didn't just stop at full sets either. He made sure I had a full set in regular and holographic. If the card was printed in English and it had Pokemon on it, I had it. Later, my grandfather was over when the boy upstairs was down playing with me. He asked the boy if he had more cards than me now. The boy quietly had to admit that no, he did not. When the boy later left, my mother mentioned to me that it was not about who had more cards than whom. My grandfather quickly responded by saying, No, no, no. Of course it's not about who has more cards. But if he's ever getting close to you, you let me know. What a champion grandfather right here. Just a hardworking dude that focused on nothing but making their grandchild happy. To make sure their grandchild had as great an experience as possible. Now that is a model grandfather right there. My only question is, can I go back in time and have him fuel my Yu-Gi-Oh addiction in the same vein? No? Okay. And our final story of the day is by CrewDog3950, Laundry Tossed on the Floor, Revenge Time. Back in the early 2000s, I lived in the military barracks. Just about everything is communal. After living there for about a year, I ran into an issue in doing my laundry. 
Every weekend I would do my laundry early on Saturday morning to get it taken care of and out of the way. One Saturday morning, I started my laundry and ran it through the wash. I had the timing down to know when it would be done washing and drying, so I went and changed over the laundry to the dryer. I started the dryer and went back to my room and set my timer so I would know when it's done. No biggie, right? Well, I go down when my timer goes off to get my laundry. To my surprise, it was on the floor in a pile and still wet. I was angry, but I picked up my laundry and put it into another dryer. I also left a note on the dryer that had my clothes in it, previously simply stating that it wasn't cool to take my clothes out of the dryer and throw them on the floor. I also notified the dorm manager and he said he will look into it. Later that week, there was a sign put up in the laundry room stating that if you mess with someone else's clothes, you will be reprimanded. Of course, this was a hollow threat and no one was ever found during the investigation. So fast forward a few weeks and this kept happening. I just happened to go back into the laundry to check on my stuff and there she was taking my stuff out of the dryer and throwing it on the floor. I confronted her and she basically said that this was her dryer and I couldn't use it. I picked up my stuff and put it into another dryer and thought that now that I know who was doing it, that there could be some kind of action taken. I told the dorm manager I found out who it was and that he needed to do something about it. And he didn't. So I thought about a way I could get back at her. Now, I'm not exactly proud of my next action, but I was pissed off and tired of this happening. I went to a local hunting store and purchased a bottle of deer urine. I waited for my opportunity and struck. She had put her clothes in the dryer and I poured the entire bottle of the deer urine into the dryer, then turned it on for a full cycle of high heat. Needless to say, it made a horrible smell and her clothes were ruined. I didn't get into any trouble, she couldn't prove it was me. Now before everyone starts bashing me, I could have handled this differently. I should have gone above the dorm manager's head to the first sergeant and let him deal with it. I was immature at the time and wanted to take action on my own. I think it's definitely a lot to go and buy a bunch of deer urine and basically ruin their clothes, but numerous times they went, pulled your clothes out, threw them on the ground so uncaring and said that I own this dryer, you can't use it. Nobody was wanting to help you out, there was no resolution, and this person was being a downright witch to you. So yeah, it was a lot, but I do think she probably had it coming. And in retrospect, I wouldn't feel too bad about it because they obviously didn't give a single care about your stuff. A big company and its new manager held off our pay. We took in all their sale. Premise. I work for a technology company, which falls in the startup slash medium enterprise category. Let us refer to this as my company. We were working on creation of an internet of thing, IOT based product for large industries. But as we were new to the domain, we had hired a couple of industry experts to help us understand the domain and help us with understanding the gaps. This is a common practice. Enters bigger company, a company that had been dealing with devices for over 15 years now. They had a product in our same domain named big product. They had Big Product version 5 running in various places which was built on a legacy stack. Their new version, Big Product 6.0, tanked really hard among their clients and they needed someone who dealt with better technology to help them build their product and that brought them to us. The coming of Bigger Company was really good for our product as they had really good insights to bring to the table. As being a major player, they wanted us to build Big Product 7.0 instead of our product, but being a product company, that was out of scope. Thus, we decided to be the API providers for the backend capabilities while the UI looks different. Think of it as different buttons in your web page, but similar functionality. We were also responsible for bundling and deploying the application. Legally, we have signed a contract that says my company clearly owns the code and they have no right to see or recreate our code just to make us indispensable as API providers for bigger company. Things have been going well for both of us and both products were shaping up well. Incident. Suddenly, one day, bigger company gets a new guy to handle the product, big manager, 
and we see some red flags immediately. Major escalation and blame gaming for every deployment and everything, eventually to a point where we were tired of the engagement with bigger company. We were targeting a major product expo for October 2019, and so were they. With the big manager came in some associates who kept asking technical questions and logic and stuff and pestering our developers, which led to a suspicion that they were trying to micromanage and peep in on our tech stack, which made our team work on better encryption for our code, essentially making things even better for us. He changed a few keys in the database and complained that there was a bug. We sealed off the database. He decided to not pay for the engagement showing our incompetence. He also sold the license to the product without paying us to some of his clients. One fine day, they called a junior developer asking some doubts which resulted in him joining a call with them. The link was soon shared in our team's chat and almost all of us, including my CEO, joined the call. Now, we promptly had things recorded. Our plan was simple make sure that their product doesn't get presented for the major expo. We pulled sufficient proof to prove that there was non-compliance with our contract. The next day, we pull in the legal team and decide to call off the engagement. We also hand over the entire documentation on the same day. The team had pulled an all-nighter also. We had seen this coming. One of the things that was scheduled for next week was to make their deployment HTTPS compliant. Now, for most on-premise deployments and plants, People really don't go with SSL enabled products, but for the expo, a secure deployment was mandatory. They did not have this, which meant they can talk about their product, but can't show it in real time. We actually were open with a try it out for free. Now, things looked bad for them for the expo, but they were still bigger players and had a larger client base. We changed the look of our product and called it our product 2.0. It is the same product, but looks different and word got out that Big Product 7.0 runs on our Product 1.0, and man, our stalls were filled with their clients who were not pleased with their earlier product. 6.0, the one that tanked. What Big Manager might have never understood is that what actually happened wrong for him. With every escalation mail he sent, our team became slower for him. We pushed him to a place where he decided to build on his own. What he did not realize was that was exactly what we wanted him to do. We had started the preparation of 2.0 in parallel for the expo. We had every intention of ditching them before the expo. We had no intention of upgrading their security for the expo. Soon after the expo, we canceled the license to all their clients and when they came barging into the doors of bigger company, they pointed to us. We were more than happy to reinstate their products as a gesture for their inconvenience. We gave them our product, 2.0, with no migration changes. Bigger company currently doesn't sell the software, or do they? They are pretty much irrelevant. Congratulations, bigger company. You played yourselves. For those of you that might not have followed all the technical stuff, let me try and rephrase it quickly so you might understand. So big company is this much bigger company that has a product already out there. But unfortunately, their latest release had issues. So they looked to the smaller OP's My Company to help them redevelop the product. This is great for little My Company because they don't have a client base and the bigger company has already experienced the issues that they would need to fill My Company in when doing development. So you need to watch out for this thing that could go wrong. You need to include this feature because people want this from our experience. And so my company is basically helping them build their next version of the product. Now the issue started coming along where bigger companies started trying to get information on what they were doing and basically pushing to a point where they would be able to own all the work my company was doing for them. My company quietly started protecting their stuff and eventually decided they had enough of it and completely pulled out of the engagement knowing that now they have the experience and the expertise to build their own product that can compete with bigger company all the while bigger company pointing their hands at my company which is unexpectedly making their clients leave for my company's work. So in the end bigger company played themselves. Our next story is by Cobbler Reasonable. Wife obliterates her place of work over being mocked for a typo. 
Despite the title and what happened, this only technically qualifies for petty revenge given what happened is only technically petty. So keep this in mind, my wife is a scientist. She's not just any scientist either. My wife is a freaking genius. I don't mean this lightly. My wife, frankly, could be on the level of Curie. She graduated with highest honors. Her place of work has openly told her they are going to make her a manager as soon as possible as soon as she has the, legally required in her field, years of experience to be put in charge. My wife had offers out of college to come do paid research but declined because she could have made better money elsewhere. I've tried encouraging her to do research but she doesn't want to. I have watched my wife wreck others in her field using the knowledge she has of her field. Technically, there is a degree above hers, and the people with that degree get told not to freak with her at all. A lot of the older scientists in her field cannot stand how she is treated or that she is more knowledgeable than them. She doesn't think any of it is due to sexism, as lots of scientists around her act this way regardless of gender. Another thing about my wife, if she didn't work for said company, the place would have had to have closed its doors. She was doing the work of about 40 people, not taking breaks, and lunches. Mostly because she works in healthcare and actually gives a freak about patients and knows these are trying times. Anything that was done by any of their branches were being sent directly to her lab and she was doing it all for them. There are a few 20 year vets of her field that feel like they are way above everyone. And recently my wife sent out a letter with a typo. It would be like typing this. Instead of today you write, Toadie, I had to, whatever. Well, boss's boss's boss, Dr. Richard Face, who is pretty much a massive sexist, can't confirm but suspect it's only women he does this to, calls her in and turns his screen around. What is this? And gestures to his screen. My wife looks at it. Uh, a typo? Exactly, you went to college, you should know how to spell. He starts going on a rant, slowly raising his voice and yelling about how she should be smarter than this. My wife cuts him off. Sir, I'm a chemist and a scientist, not an English major. I don't have time for the shoot when I'm doing the work of five different offices. Obviously, if the company feels you have time to berate me for a commonplace typo, I don't need to be here and working. I'm taking the day off. You can't do that. If you leave, you are fired. I get calls every day asking me to come to work for different companies for more money than I make here. I'm here because this is healthcare and clearly this is where I'm needed. Or at least I thought that was the case. I'm going home and you can freak right on off. When I come into work Monday, I anticipate your boss will be in here and we will have a long discussion about how much time you wasted and the value of human life. So I thought said story was a bit dramatized. I had to pick my wife up early, we have one car, and I'm off today, so hey, whatever. While we are driving home, my wife's boss calls her, begging her to come back in. She says no. My wife's boss says they are threatening to fire her if she doesn't convince my wife to come, saying without her they have to close the lab. My wife asks, did Mr. Richard Face threaten this? Her boss confirms and my wife replies, he isn't going to fire you or I'm going to fire him. My wife then calls Dr. Richard Face's boss and gets on the phone with him. She proceeds to explain what happened, what she did, and what caused all of this. Dr. Richard Face sends an email talking about how she cussed at him. He started cussing at her first, just for your information. Then, Dr. Richard Face is immediately fired after the company forced him to apologize. So you're telling me that this guy brought in OP's wife just to belittle her over a typo? Saying, oh, you must not be that smart. You went to college. You shouldn't be making these mistakes. It's healthcare. What does it matter if you make one typo? Unless you made a typo that said somebody died when they didn't, I don't think it matters. If you were put in this situation, would you either try to go up the chain of command or would you just start looking for a new job altogether? Let me know which of those two would appeal to you more in the comments down below. Our next story is written by Sheet Mask Wine Baking. Don't challenge my work ethic. I will use that same work ethic to make you regret it. Female law student here. My university organizes this major moot court competition, which is part of an international competition. 
We organize the rounds for all national level contestants, and then the qualifying teams go to the international rounds. It's one of the most esteemed competitions of the world, so the stakes are generally pretty high. I was selected to be the coordinator for the national rounds because I have worked with the organizing team before, and I have a reputation of being absolutely thorough in my work and never leaving room for errors or loopholes. One thing I realized when I took charge was that things have always been done with a bit of a lax attitude, so I revamped the whole structure. I made sure we had proper rules of procedure in place and all instructions were communicated to the teams beforehand so there was never any scope of doubt on our end and no team could accuse us of foul play because our university also participates in the competition every year. Due to COVID, we had to cancel the physical rounds where the teams would argue before the judges and only accept memorial submissions, where each team send in their written arguments in a prescribed format for each party to the case. The memorials are judged on content, but there are penalties for not adhering to the format. The top scoring teams would go for the international rounds. Since it was just memorial submissions now, there was a higher burden on us to ensure they were properly checked and I did exactly that. One of our rules is regarding zero plagiarism, and I had sent the plagiarism guidelines to all the teams in advance, which was also very detailed. We used Turnitin Portal for plagiarism check, so we have a similarity index where certain things wouldn't be counted as plagiarism. Name of the competition, facts of the case, citations, things like that. But we made sure to define what plagiarism is, lifting arguments from sources and passing them off as your own without citing them. And the penalty for plagiarism is disqualification. We had also internally decided amongst the organizing team that we wouldn't disqualify any team because we recognize the amount of hard work that goes into drafting memorials, especially in the middle of a pandemic when most people don't have access to university libraries. This one team had almost 80% plagiarism in all their memorials, which was way above the acceptable limit that was covered by our similarity index. I sent them their Turnitin reports, expecting a typical groveling apology with a please don't disqualify us, which I would graciously accept. However, this team instead decided to send us an email full of accusations. They claim that we weren't doing our jobs properly and that we are relying on softwares when memorial checking requires human intervention and there was laxity in our work. They went on and on about how we are dumb to not realize that the things that are showing up plagiarized are all the things I mentioned above as part of the similarity index. The 80% was apart from all these things, they did not acknowledge that. They cried foul play and warned us not to throw around serious accusations lightly. Where they messed up was in claiming that I hadn't done my due diligence and threatening me. What they didn't know is that I had personally gone over every single memorial submitted to us, which was close to a hundred, to ensure that no team tried to dupe us into thinking their memorials were original. As a student, I know exactly all the ways to beat Turn It In. One of the ways is by replacing every fifth word in the paragraph you've copied, which is what the team had done. I went over their memorials, all six of them, again. I cross-checked them with what the original sources were and highlighted all of the paragraphs, sentences, even citations that were copied, along with highlighting the text in the original source material. This included all the paragraphs where they had replaced the fifth word. In the end, their entire memorial showed up as plagiarized. I wrote back to them, attached the highlighted memorials, the highlighted sources documents. I also color coordinated the highlighted texts and attached a key so they would be reminded of which part of their memorial was copied from which source. I wrote that they'll find that there is no laxity in our work and with some human intervention, we can always tell when someone has tried to dupe the software. I added that my initial plan was to let them off with a heavy penalty, but that if they did not wish to acknowledge their transgressions, I would have to disqualify them and inform their university authorities, which would have very serious consequences. I got a reply a little later with a humble apology stating that they will accept whatever penalty we would want to impose and would like to avoid disqualification if possible. 
nothing made me happier than seeing that email. There's a whole other joy to using the proper mechanisms to put someone in their place. OP is more than gracious to not disqualify these people after plagiarizing 80% of their work and then trying to claim that it wasn't and trying to challenge their ethic. I really hope these people that submitted these memorials understand just how much they got away with here. Our next story is by Yasabo13, don't be mean to old ladies. My friend and I were in Tesco food shopping. As we turned into an aisle, there was a man with his trolley stretched across the aisle, blocking it, and an elderly lady asking him politely to move. He ignored her, then snapped, you can wait, at her. She simply turned around and went back down the aisle away from him. As we shopped, we saw the same interaction a couple more times. Now, we don't know the details of how it started, but this man was deliberately seeking the old lady out and blocking her way. As we turned into the biscuit aisle, about two-thirds of the way down was the man, with his trolley behind him, engrossed in the biscuits. As we approached, I looked at my friend and gently pushed my trolley forward and in front of her. She immediately gripped the trolley handle and I walked up to his trolley, gripped the handle and we were off. We didn't rush got to the end of the aisle and turned into another aisle. We took his trolley, very full, to the far corner of the store and left it. When we reached the checkout, we told the cashier we had seen an abandoned trolley in the far corner. Didn't want good food wasted or going off. I just wish I could have seen his face when he turned around with his packet of biscuits to find his trolley gone. I don't know what this old lady did to the guy, unless she was saying some incredibly insensitive stuff. Who's going to go out of their way to block an old lady in a shopping aisle? Multiple times at that. I'd say it seems pretty justified. The worst this guy has to do is go and shop over again. And our final story of the day is by Ren Lobo. Wake my mother. It'll cost you. One day, back in the late 90s, my mother tells me she has been getting phone calls between 2 and 4 a.m. every day for a week. She says she hears a strange noise when she answers it. I realize it's a fax machine. So I bring my computer over to try and figure out who the heck it is. I set up the computer to receive the fax and spend the night. In the morning, I pull up the fax on the computer and it's for some paving company. It's a bill for a private school in town. So I call the paving company and tell them they have the wrong number and to stop faxing my mother at 3am. The guy gives me attitude and hangs up. I leave my computer just in case. Next day, same crap with the fax. This time though, it was an advertisement. What the freak? So I wait until after they are closed for the day and send them a fax back. It says, stop faxing my mother at 3 a.m. at XXX phone number, then 200 pages of solid black to make sure and run out all the toner in the cartridge. Never gotta call her fax again. Never mess with my mom. This story really makes the whole computer and faxing thing sound like a wild wild west kind of deal. Now, I realize faxing has been around for a long time since before the late 90s, but it's just kind of funny to imagine a situation where they're trying to fax you randomly in the middle of the night to try and send you some advertisement or something. And if ink or toner is as expensive as it is today, I sure hope whoever sent it got enough money out of the advertisements to make the money back to pay for the toner. Ex-best friend slept with my ex-GF and blackmailed me, so I got him mocked by his friends and fired from his job. Sorry about the title, not really all that great with them. So, I'm a gay man, though it took me a long time to actually come to terms with it. During the time when I was questioning my sexuality, I was dating who I thought was a lovely girl. I'll call her Jane. I genuinely loved her and pictured us having a future together as we'd been dating for three years, and had started to get pretty serious, even though we were only 18 when he split us up. You lot know what young love is like. Anyway, the only other important people in the story are my ex-best friend James and my absolutely incredible boyfriend Alex. Not their real names by the way. Also, this is a long read so sorry about that. I tend to ramble and I'm not much of a writer so sorry if this kinda sucks. James and I had been friends since we were about 10 or 11 and we got close, to the point that we felt more like brothers than best friends. He was really supportive of my relationship with Jane and would constantly talk about how glad he was that she made me happy. Though when I look back on it now, 
He had a habit of constantly talking about how gorgeous she was, how sexy she was, and how I was such a lucky guy. I understand the last one, but he was a bit excessive when he talked about how attractive Jane was, but I was young and naive at the time and didn't think anything of it. That was, until I caught them. I'm not much of a writer, but essentially I noticed that they were both becoming pretty possessive over their phones. They'd randomly disappear claiming to be feeling ill or having to get some project done and I know it sounds stupid, but I kept noticing that the condoms I was buying were going missing. I always liked to make sure we had enough for precautions. I wound up going to Jane's house one day and when she'd bailed on me claiming to have a migraine, I was partly worried for her health and brought some painkillers food and bottled water in case she genuinely did feel ill but I also had a feeling in the pit of my stomach that she was lying to me. I don't know how to explain it, I just knew. Sure enough, when I let myself in with the spare key she'd given me, I found her in bed with James. I was heartbroken. The two people who I cared about most in the world and who I thought cared about me went behind my back like this. I was furious. We had a major argument Jane begged me to listen to her whilst James yelled at me and I eventually just stormed out. I wanted to go and tell everyone what they'd done and shame them for it, but that's where the problem arose. Remember at the start where I mentioned that I was questioning my sexuality? James knew about it. Of course, he knew I'd never leave Jane to sleep with a bunch of guys, but he was fully aware that I'd figured out that I was attracted to guys and girls. More like just Jane in particular, as I don't really feel any attraction towards girls anymore. And he used this against me. He knew full well how terrified I was that my parents would disown me, and he made sure to remind me that if I didn't keep my mouth shut, then my parents would find out. At the time, this was absolutely terrifying, though I know now that they accept me 100% and still love me. So I kept my mouth shut. I was stuck having to work with James at his father's garage as I couldn't come up with a way to explain how I was mad at him without letting everyone know what he did and risking getting outed to my parents. Besides, I needed the money and there weren't a whole lot of other jobs I could apply for. Also, I really should mention that James was going out of his way to harass me at work calling me a bunch of slurs whenever he got the chance, pushing me around and just generally reminding me that he could tell my parents at any point. I got really low at this point and the only time I actually felt sort of content to just let myself relax and be myself was when I would go to the local gay bars. There was one club in particular that I loved to go to, a drag club where I met my boyfriend Alex. He was a drag queen there and helped out behind the bar and stuff when he was needed. To save any confusion, I'm just going to use he, him pronouns for him, though they do switch when he's in drag. We flirted for a few weeks before gradually becoming friends with benefits. He is amazing and I know it sounds cheesy, but I was the happiest I'd ever been when he agreed to be my boyfriend. But that's skipping a little bit ahead. This revenge happened before we started dating and we were still just friends who'd hook up every now and then. After a few months, I finally worked up the courage to open up to Alex about what happened with Jane and James, and that's when an evil look fell over his face. See, Alex is the sweetest guy you could ever meet, but if you piss him off, he can and will turn into an evil genius. Around this time, James had been bragging to me that the ladies loved him and he could get any girl he wanted. I really doubt that. He'd always been kinda like this, but he upped the bragging in an attempt to annoy me. He also told me how any girl that I dated would leave me in an instant to sleep with him. So, Alex suggested we put that to the test. Cue the revenge. We started off small. See, James had given me his email address a few years prior and, just as I'd thought, he couldn't be bothered to change it. So I decided to be very generous and sign him up to a premium subscription to several gay adult movie websites and decided to be courteous and agree to receive emails about notifications new offers and other things he may be interested in, just to be nice and make sure he had some variety. Oh, did I mention that this was the email address he allowed his father to use? Oops. It cost me a fair bit of money, but I made sure that he got the best offers. Alex was more than happy to chip in to help me. It was worth it. When we were working in the garage and his dad stormed in and asked to speak to him, now, his dad didn't really give a crap about his kid being gay, but he was mortified that his son would order this much adult movies and put it in their shared email address. He genuinely thought for months that James was a s addict. 
we may have signed him up for a bit more than we thought. I logged into the email after the first two weeks of him being signed up for the subscriptions, and he had well over 100 emails about his accounts. This is when, like we'd hoped, James started getting more aggressive. He'd barge into me, screw up my work to get me in trouble, and send me disgusting messages, as well as threatening and insulting me in person. I took note of everything. I kept a notepad to log the dates and times of the incidents and kept a detailed description of everything he did. Every insult and every threat. I'd screenshot all the messages from him and record every insult and threat that he'd hurl at me on my phone. Alex helped me organize all of this onto files and then we saved it all onto a hard drive. This would be important for later. This is when we decided to move on to the next phase of our plan. The girlfriend. And no, not Jane. Also, I should mention that he and Jane split up only a couple of weeks after I found out about the affair. They were never gonna last. See, Alex passes extremely well when he's in drag. Being feminine already makes it a bit easier. His voice isn't all that deep and he can sometimes be mistaken for a girl with a slightly deeper voice. He usually exaggerates his makeup and clothing, but for this phase of the plan, we decided to get him to tone down the makeup slightly to make it appear more natural and a mutual friend of ours took him aside and gave Alex some of her clothes to wear. We then created a fake Facebook account for my new girlfriend and Alex and I posted some cute couple photos on this account and my own personal Facebook account, posting all your usual lovey-dovey stuff that you see on couples social media. Then we put our plan into action. Alex would come pick me up from work a couple days a week dressed as an extremely beautiful girl if I do say so myself. We'd chat, hold hands, hug and kiss, and just generally act like a couple. James obviously noticed. He took the bait and began chatting to Alex when he was waiting for me to finish up and eventually wound up sending him, or our fake account, a friend request which Alex was all too happy to accept. It took a few weeks, but after a while of just talking about work, school, TV shows, and music, James finally started to edge his and Alex's conversations into more sexual territory, which was exactly what we were looking for. Alex answered accordingly. He had tried to send Alex illicit photos, hoping to get some in return, but we deleted those straight away. We thought that would be a little too far, even for this D-bag. This continued for a few weeks until we had everything in place. Alex made sure to screenshot the messages and then we went ahead and changed the name of the Facebook account to Alex's name and deleted the couple pictures on it. I sent the screenshots of the conversations with Alex to James' friends. They were pretty accepting and were usually the ones to call James out when he was being an a-hole and they took great pleasure in mocking James for it. The look on James's face when his friends mentioned his little boy toy was absolutely priceless. I'm not sure he'll ever live it down. The people he picked on at school even snapped back at him that he was the one who was sexting another guy, so where the heck did he get off calling them a bundle of sticks? This pissed him off to no end as he knew they were right, even if he hadn't known Alex was a boy at the time. James also had the sort of expected reaction and started sending Alex a bunch of hateful messages and threats, only helping our case as we'd screenshot the messages and add it to the folders on the hard drive. Once I had what we thought was enough evidence, I decided to take it all to James's dad, mine and James's boss, and explained everything that was going on. From the cheating with Jane to the blackmail and threats, he just sat there and listened, allowing me to show him the proof I'd gathered. He did find the petty revenge with the Alex and Drag pretty funny, but the rest of the time his face was just kind of blank, with a hint of anger in his eyes. He thanked me for the information and went off to speak with his son. James got fired on the spot. I agreed not to go to the police as this could end up with some pretty bad press for his dad's company and his dad was a pretty cool guy. I knew he was all talk so there was no real threat of danger. I received an amazing reference from James's dad for a job I desperately wanted and eventually got, no doubt helped by said reference. James's parents flipped out with him. They refused to give him his job back and made him go out and actually put in the effort to get and keep a job. He had gotten used to being able to slack off as his dad owned the place and technically couldn't fire him. They also sold the car they'd have been letting him use and told him to pay for a new one with his own money. It took him about two years to save up enough money to buy his new car. It all eventually came out about James and Jane's affair. As for the threats of outing me, 
Alex kindly reminded James that he had absolutely no proof of me doing anything, whilst his friends all knew about the sexual messages James had sent him. You know, another guy. It would look like he was just pointing fingers because of a little petty revenge. James's father had also assured me that my secret was safe with him, so the threats of blackmail were now non-existent. James got into college on a scholarship and started hanging out with a bunch of other D-bags. I found out through a mutual friend that James was still a homophobic prick at college and was terrorizing a couple of LGBT students as well as making disgusting threats against a lesbian girl in his class. None of them wanted to do anything about this, however. Why? Because James had been lying to them and saying that his dad was one of the higher-ups in the college or something didn't pay a whole lot of attention and I can't remember exactly who he said his father was, but it was enough to make these poor kids worry that they could be kicked out of college for speaking up about this. I decided to lend a helping hand. With the help of our mutual friend, I emailed a bunch of the disgusting screenshots, recordings of some of the threats and some of the homophobic, racist and sexist things he'd posted on his Facebook page, which he had deleted before the college could see them, to the higher ups in the college. They were not happy with what they saw. They eventually revoked his scholarship after a few of the students, with some encouragement, spoke up about the harassment and threats. I honestly have no clue why he turned out like this. His parents are absolutely lovely, open-minded people. It's crazy. James's parents kicked him out after that. He stayed with his friends for a few months before he managed to get an apartment. Last I heard, he was working in a fast food restaurant, working to get into another college. I genuinely hope he bettered himself and that he can do well in his life. Everyone's capable of change, right? I'd also like to clarify that I didn't care all that much about getting back at Jane because, yes, she did have the affair, but I was getting some revenge on James for the blackmail and threats that came after it. Jane had showed me proof that she'd tried to prevent James from blackmailing me and told him to just let it go. If they'd both just stopped speaking to me after the affair, then this whole thing wouldn't have happened. I'd have been hurt and maybe a little awkward at work, but I wouldn't have went out of my way to get back at him. Though I did fill Jane's mother in on what actually happened and sent her some screenshots where Jane admitted to the affair. This was after I found out that she had told her mother that I was the one who cheated with a bunch of guys and girls, instead of the we just grew apart version that we'd agreed to tell our parents. From what I heard, her mother was not all that pleased with her. I also sent a few of the texts where she admitted to having an affair to her new boyfriend. Needless to say, he wasn't happy to find out that the abusive ex was actually just an ex who she'd cheated on. They're still together from what I heard, so all I can say to that guy is, good luck my dude. I eventually did end up coming out to my parents and they were surprisingly supportive, which was amazing, and Alex and I got together a year or two after these events and we're still very much in love. I think that's just about the best outcome you could have for this dude that was blackmailing them and trying to hold this secret over their head when it's one of the most sensitive and private topics a person could have. I'm glad OP found Alex and to anybody listening or watching this video, I hope you have or find your own version of Alex. Wanna be rude and condescending? You only get six sauce packets now. I work in fast food and customers can be real a-holes. This Karen came into the drive-thru and wanted 8 sauce packets for her 20-piece nugget. We are supposed to charge if they get more than 4 sauce packets for a 20-piece. I usually don't charge customers because I don't care that much, but this lady was being super condescending and rude. I charged her for 2 extra sauce packets, meaning that she should get 6 in total. I was still going to give her the 8, but I thought charging her for only 2 was enough to get my revenge. When she got to my window, I asked her to park while we waited for her food. She said, Fine, I'll park, but there better be 8 sauce packets because you freaking charged me extra. I smiled and said okay. That's when I realized that charging her was not enough. She still wanted to be a witch, so I only put 6 sauces, like I was supposed to because that's all she was charged for. I brought her food out. A minute later, the Karen runs into the store, screaming at me that I only put six in the bag when she demanded eight. I told her she was only charged for six and if she wanted extra, then I would have to charge her for two more. She threw coins on the counter and yelled at me for being petty. She also explained that she had just been diagnosed with stage four cancer that day and that I should respect my elders. Again, I smiled and handed her the barbecue sauce and said, sorry about your cancer. 
Of course, she then continued to scream about how she was going to corporate. That day was very satisfying. My coworkers and I still talk about this story and refer to her as Barbecue Sauce Lady. Does anybody else have their own version of Barbecue Sauce Lady that this story brought to mind? If so, let me know in the comment section down below. It's small, but it must have felt nice to get her to buck up for those extra two sauce packets. But with that being said, that's all the stories we have for today. So what I want to know is, which of these stories was your personal favorite of the day and why? Let me know which story and why in the comments section down below. And thank you all so very much for watching and listening to the Storytime channel today. If you haven't yet, please consider subscribing and don't forget to turn notifications on so you'll never miss an upcoming video from the Storytime channel. Thank you all again so very much for watching and listening to the Storytime channel.